Welcome, everybody, to the summer series, week two of the Pro Chess League's Division B in this summer series. And uh, as you can see in the standings here, um, we've got uh, in the first week, we have the Barcelona Raptors recently relegated, but uh, starting off the summer series well with five points out of a possible six in the first week followed by the uh, Puffins, the Puffins, the Puffins, with three, and Baden Baden with three. Um, so those two teams uh, still it, well in contention for first place, or uh, at least second place to get a playoff spot. And um, we are joined right now by international master Gudmundur Kjartansen. And uh, thank you for being here, Gudmundur. And uh, the uh, deputy commissioner, of the Pro Chess League, Isaac Steinkamp. Hi, Isaac. Hey there. And, uh, we're going to hear from Goodmunder about uh, the Puffins and maybe chess in Iceland. And uh, while they are doing their interview, uh, you guys can uh, hop on some of those links and join a fan club and join a match. The first match will be Reykjavik against <laughs> Barcelona. So they'll take on the, the top team in the first week. And uh, that'll start in 15 minutes. So you guys have 14 minutes to uh, join one of those two fan clubs and get into that tournament. Yeah, for sure. And I'm really excited to be talking with Goodmunder today about the Reykjavik Puffins. Last week was the Reykjavik Puffins' first Pro Chess League match in 471 days. And you guys did it by beating the Pro Chess League finalists. How important, it, how important is it for the Reykjavik Puffins to have such a strong fan base backing you guys this early into the tournament? Um, well, I think it always helps to feel the support and uh, actually I didn't play the last match but so I'm just coming in fresh for, for the second match now against against Barcelona and and yeah. So you mentioned that you didn't play in last week's match. We actually did a little bit of research on your past Pro Chess League games and we found that your last Pro Chess League game you went two and a half out of four against the Buenos Aires Kraken beating Alan Pichot, uh, you know, who is the best player that you beat on that day. You've got a you've got a pretty tough challenge today. You're playing Daniel Force and Esteban, who did really well for Barcelona last week. How are you right. planning on using the ten plus two time control in your favor to outplay Daniel Force and Esteban? Um, I don't know. I haven't thought so far. <laughs> Just playing the game. I mean, uh, I think uh, you can play any time control. You just have to adjust to it. So I think it's it's um, ten. Plus two, it's not something I play quite regularly, so I guess I have to kind of try to adjust to that. But I mean, I know I'm playing a strong opponent, so just see what happens. Absolutely. <laughs> and how important is it for you personally today to do well in the Pro Chess League Summer Series with the Pro Chess League qualifiers coming up later this year? Um, well, just... When Inquar, our, our team captain Inquar Johansson, when he tells us to play, we just play. And, you know, if we don't do well, he'll probably not be so happy. So to please him, I'll try to do my best. You know. <laughs> no, no, but we are, we are uh, a team, of course. And, and uh, I think it's, I mean, okay, we're playing, this pro league is for fun, but there's also some seriousness to it, I think. And, and I think, um, just the whole atmosphere around it is um, something I enjoy that, you know, having a league like that, it started, how long How long ago did you start? Three years ago? Four years? So we're about to enter the fourth year of the... the fourth year, yeah, exactly, yeah. So I think just the whole concept, you know, uh, you could feel right away that it was something uh, exciting to be a part of. And you like you've seen all these strong players that are willing to take part in it. So, um, yeah, I mean, we, we try to go as far as we can, but um, uh, I don't know if, if I can say it's how important it is, is for me personally. I mean, I just try to play well and, and like uh, the whole team tries to play well and and just see how far we can go. But <clears throat> I, I, it's not something I think too much about. Let's talk a little bit about this matchup that you've got in a few minutes and 11 minutes for those of you who are watching and want to join the live club match. You're playing mm -hmm. against the Barcelona Raptors, who was a recently relegated team, Reykjavik also being relegated in 2018. So a lot of you know interest in terms of who's going to win this matchup, in terms of who might have that edge going into the qualifier. 
how important is it to get off to a really good start and you know for your fans to play you know really well especially on the bottom boards here um well to be honest i'm just still trying to uh <laughs> Uh, understand the whole format around it because, like I said, I, I was traveling, so I just I'm just coming in to the first match right now, so I missed the first match and and I haven't been able to follow so closely. So yeah, like I said, just when Inquart tells you to play, you just play and that's it. And um, yeah, so I don't know the standings. <laughs> I don't know too much to be honest. Were you were you traveling for chess just now? Uh, yeah, I was traveling in Italy, so I played uh, two tournaments, and then uh, I also went for meditation. So, okay, so, how did your tournaments go? Uh, it went well. First tournament went quite badly, and then uh, somehow I managed to turn it around, and I managed to win this uh, weekend tournament, five round weekend tournament. So that was uh, like surprising considering how badly I was playing in the other tournaments. So, so yeah, it, it went quite well in, like, uh, yeah, you could say that. Cool. So you're playing against, you know, potentially three different grandmaster to, grandmasters today. Competing today, you've obviously got Daniel Force and Esteban in this match, and then knockout battles, you could play Dimitri Collars or Alexander Shabalov. Have you played any of these three grandmasters before? And if you um, have, what are you going to do in these games to try to give yourself an edge? Well, I'm, I've played uh, Dimitri Kollars before. He's a young, um, talented, like young, strong um, German GM. So we played in this close tournament in, in Germany. And he was an IM back then, but he was still quite strong. And, and I managed to beat him. But, you know, he's, he's probably, he's a bit stronger today than he was then. So, you know. And all these guys are very strong, so I, I understand that. And I'll just try to do my best and then play okay chess and and make Inquart happy. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like the main thing is you're <laughs> is you're motivated by Ingvar. No, no, no. It's just um, I'm kind of saying it just to fool around, you know. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm just kidding as well, of course. But um, um, no. I mean, he is the. I mean, he is the one who he's our team captain he's he's the one who has done most most for the, the puffins to promote our team and to to uh you know like he when when we saw this uh, this uh like when when the first season started of pro league he he just right away grabbed the idea and, and you know made this team uh and um so yeah he's he's kind of been the one who has done most for the team and and so on, but uh, there are we are a lot of puffins, I guess, and um, I don't know how many we are in total that have played for the puffins, but uh, yeah, I mean, we all try to do our best when we play, and yeah, it's like like you said, it's been a while since I played last time. We played against uh, this team from Buenos Aires, and. Um, uh, yeah, the reason why it's been such a long time is yeah, mostly because I'm traveling so much, so chess, and then uh, um, just it's kind of difficult to, um, you know, play when you have a tournament or, or you have some other plans or schedule, like your schedule is just full. So, so that's the main reason. But I mean, the the previous times I've, I've enjoyed a lot and. And yeah, I'm also excited about this season. Right, for sure. So thank you, thank you for giving us a little bit of insight in terms of what you've been up to, Goodmunder. And we're wishing you the best of luck in your your personal match against Daniel Force and Esteban today. You've got about seven minutes before your live club match starts, so we're going to let you go. Um, okay. But good luck in your uh, good luck in your games. We'll be keeping a close eye on both of them. Okay. Yes, thank you for having me. Goodbye. All right, so. Playing for Ingvar, a lot of respect for Ingvar and everything that he's done for the Reykjavik uh, team, for organizing them as uh, as manager. Um, I would love to get that much respect as manager for my players, definitely. <laughs> I don't know how you felt as a manager too, Isaac. Yeah, I mean, were that I don't, great for your I don't ever, 
I don't ever think I wanted my players to be playing purely for me. I think I always wanted them to just focus on playing their best chess, and not worry about what the manager thinks, and you know, what, you know, as the armchair coach or whatever. But uh, it's great to hear that they've got a really supportive manager who really wants to watch them do well, especially in the pro chess league. Yeah. All right. So we're going to cover the format again briefly. I mean, some of you have been here for, for five weeks with us now and you know the format and you're like, stop telling us about the format. So we'll go quickly for you, but there's always new people. There's always new people hearing about this, finding out about this or choosing to play for the first time. So the number one thing that you need to know about the format, if you're about to play for the first time is the time control. That's the first thing you want to know. If you're ever playing a chess game is how much time do you have? Not who's your opponent or any of that, but what time do you have? You've got 10 minutes. You've got 10 minutes and a two second increment. So if you're planning to flag your opponent at the end, um, good luck with that. They've got two seconds to at least make a move. So if you're down two queens, flagging is probably not going to work out. Um, the other thing is that you're going to play white and black against the same opponent. Um, so basically, if you're like the number three player for the Reykjavik team or the number 13 player for the Reykjavik team, you'll play the number 13 player for the Barcelona team. And first, you'll play them with white or black and then you'll play them with the other color so you'll get to play both colors it'll be a fair two-game match and uh yeah that your your second game will start as soon as the first one's over you won't necessarily wait for everybody to finish their first game on your team um what else do you want to say about the format isaac is that yeah, so I mean, the live club matches are always the most interesting part. I mean, this is the ultimate equalizer, right? If you've got fans who are really supportive of your team, we've seen teams, you know, maybe not do as great on the top board, but be able to thrive in this part of the competition because they've just got such loyal fan bases. I'm thinking of teams like the Chengdu Pandas in Group A, and namely the Reykjavik Puffins last week against Pittsburgh Pong Grabbers. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so one other thing about the general format for the summer series is that from each division of four teams, the top two teams get into the summer series championships for sure. And that's going to mean a lot more money for those teams. Um, so, uh, definitely into the top two, you get into the summer series championship third place. You get into a Twitter vote. I think basically you aim for the top two and like, once you realize you're not in the top two, then like the Twitter vote is kind of like a consolation thing. You're like, well, at least let's not finish fourth. And who knows, maybe people will vote for us. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, obviously for a lot of these teams, the goal is to get into the playoffs and make a big statement, either going into the protest league qualifier for some of these teams or for the protest league regular season. We saw how Chengdu and St. Louis finished out group A and, you know, continue to show that they were dominant forces in the protest league. But this group is, you know, going to be a little bit interesting. I mean, we've got you know, four teams that I think all have an equal shot of making the playoffs at this point. We're going to know a lot more about what these teams are capable of by the end of today. Yeah. Um, so as I said, getting to the Summer Series Championship will increase your money. So let's look at the money for a second, Isaac, because I think um, summer just sounds like fun, right? And chess sounds like fun. So people sometimes, and fans sound more like fun than like pro, right? Than pro chess. So people sometimes don't realize just how much money is at stake in the Summer Series. Um, you know, including people on my own team, probably. So, uh, <laughs> so let's just talk that for a second. I mean, first of all, just in these like divisions for finishing first, second, third, fourth in the division, teams are going to earn, you know, 1500 to $600 for the last place team, um, 1500 for the first place team. So quite a bit of money for three weeks of work right there for these yeah, organizations. Yeah, and you know, obviously being able to do well early in a live club match, I mean, that can help you set set your team apart going into the 2020 Pro Trust League season, or even if it just comes to getting a free agent for the qualifiers, which are coming up later this year. So it's really important for these teams that if you're you're a supporter, they want you to show up and they want you to play. They want you to play your best. So in that way you're able to help them become a much stronger team in the following season. Yeah, yeah. Fifteen hundred would go a long way towards uh hiring somebody good for a one day qualifier, right? I mean, you could get pretty much anyone in the world for that. Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, for a one day qualifier. Um, and then of course, each day there's a knockout battle where, you know, the four representatives of the teams, the four top players each day uh, play knockout against each other and they can win money just that day for each of those four players as well. And then um, finally, we've got the prizes in the summer series championships at the, at the end, um, which will be basically a 10 team knockout format with uh, $5,000 more in prizes there. And uh, 
Another prize, which we'll talk about a little bit more later today when we announce the winner from Division A, but there's also a fan prize. And the fan prize goes to those who play the most, um, blog, stream, tweet something the most about what's going on in the Pro Chess League Summer Series, you know, motivate their team, share what's going on. Um, so there's there's a prize there for, for all of you. So if you were thinking of playing in these matches and you're not, and then you want this prize, oops, you should join. Yeah, absolutely. And I've been really amazed by the amount of input the fans have had so far in this competition. I've been, you know, keeping track of the Summer Series hashtag on Twitter. I've been looking through the chess category to see who's streaming for which teams. And I've been really impressed with the turnout, but it's never too late to go ahead and get a head start. Keep in mind, we're only in week two of Group B. There's still next week as well. So if you get a head start now, you give yourself a really good chance at winning that fan prize for Group B. Yeah. All right, these games are getting underway right now. Boom, they're popping up on my screen. Um, we've got uh, on the first board, this account Barcelona Raptors. That's Daniel Force and Esteban, who we met last week in our interview. So if you missed last week's broadcast and you watch his games and you love his English opening style, so far he's played C4 in you know, four Whoa, out of e four white games. Did you just see this move E4? I mean, that, that, yeah. that's something where as an English player, like I've almost never seen this move order after knight F3. Uh, from really? what I understand, like this E4 move is supposed to be very dubious. I'm not sure if, uh, you know, I know that some people play knight D4. I think knight G1 is even playable in this line with the idea of playing G3, knight H3, like a reversed hyper accelerated Sicilian. But I'm very curious to see what the Reykjavik Poplins have in store here. We saw how comfortable Daniel Force and Esteban was last week choosing between these D4 and C4 setups. Immediately we see a test as early as move two. You know, could be an interesting choice, to, you know, from Goodmunder here. He's reacting quickly enough that he doesn't seem like he's never seen this move e4 before. Um, you know, the choice between trading on c6 or playing knight c2 is not a trivial choice. Um, so he didn't. Uh, I mean, either he has some idea what's going on, or he's practical enough not to blow all his time on on that kind of uh, decision. But um, sure. what I was going to say is, if anybody you know, really likes his games, wants to go back and uh, see his interview. That's that's up in uh, last week's VOD. So, you know, if you ever see a player that you really like, it's cool to be able to go back and watch their interview and learn something more about them. Yeah, for um, sure. So anyway, there's a couple openings that this is an, an analogy to with this extra C4 move in. One mm -hmm. opening is it's a little bit like the Alyekin defense, right? E5, knight f3, e4, knight to d4. That's sort of the Alyekin defense feel. And then the C pawn prevents black from playing like D5 and C5, like in the Alyekin. So they won't be able to support this advanced center pawn as well as in the Alyekin. Um, even in the Alyekin, you can't quite support this pawn. Usually you have to trade it off. Right. Um, the other opening that's less common that it could be um, seen as being related to is a variation of the Sicilian where you go E4, C5, Knight f3, and then knight f6, which I think is like called Nimzovich. I think it's named after him. I think that, yeah, I think if I recall correctly, um, that's the name of the opening there. So he attacks that pawn, and then if e5, knight to d5 gets played. And then, see, it's again sort of like a an Alyekin where you've prevented this d4 move. Um, of course, white has an extra tempo than if it's black, and the main line there is for white to play knight c3 and black to trade it. So just right. so you guys have those as sort of points of comparison for figuring out what should we or shouldn't we be doing in this opening, um, and I, I actually development so white could play a little more aggressively than than what we've seen in those other openings. Right, and I actually really like Force and Esteban's decision to play knight c2 here. You'll notice that in the position where he plays knight c2 in these structures, it's usually common for black to annoy white, punish white for playing knight c3 early by playing bishop to b4. If white had played knight b3 or knight takes c6, that doesn't take away this option of bishop b4. But the moment he plays knight c2 and then follows it up with knight c3, black is going for our Karpov system-like setup by playing bishop c5. Where that pawn sometimes belongs, you know, it should have stayed on e5. So then that way, white can't play moves like e3 and d4 as easily. Um, mm -hmm. So that's a very interesting decision there, you know, as early as move five to play this idea of knight c2. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And as I said, by analogy, the normal move in the other position would be to trade on c6. So he's taking this one extra tempo that he has as white and using it to try and keep that piece on the board. Avoid that trade, which doubles the pawns, but lets the black bishop out faster. And uh, also, as you say, prevent this bishop b4 move. That's going to give him more pressure against e4 by still having the knight on c3. And then he quickly resolves the central situation with d4 here. 
And uh, if Black retreated, then he can keep pushing forward with, you know, D5 or B4, C5 or whatever, kick all those Black pieces away, and the E4 pawn would really be in danger. Yeah, Even absolutely. Bishop G5, <laughs> just piece play might even put the pawn in sort of critical condition. So unsurprisingly, Goodmunder trades the pawn on D4 using en passant. Mm-hmm and then plays knight d4 immediately to try and keep white from rolling with d4. Um, so, I mean, this is sort of, he's got a serious strategic concern here about d4, but he's investing time. Yeah, that's one thing that I noticed immediately. He spends about 20, 20 to 30 seconds, it looks like, playing this move knight to d4. But keep in mind, black was the one who played e4 as early as move two. So I have to wonder if maybe Goodmunder is not as comfortable with this line, or maybe this idea of you know playing ed3 as opposed to queen takes d3 is you know a little bit... You know, out of out of his book, perhaps he expected like queen d3 followed by e4 with a morozzi bind knight c2 kind of setup. Um, but in this case, I mean, is this a mouse slip? That feels like a mouse slip, right? Am I? I don't think I'm missing anything here. That just that's a bishop. What's that? I'm sure Ingvar is watching, right? I mean, that's that's what we learned during the interview. Um, yeah, bishop takes d4 has to be some sort of mouse slip. It's this was an intense and combative opening. I was super interested in what's going to happen, and then bishop takes d4. I mean, the plan must have been bishop b4, right? Bishop b4, bishop d2, queen e7, or queen e7 probably doesn't help. You just trade on d2, right? Queen d2, a6, knight c3, and castle, something like that. And then black plays for d5, but now white's just up a piece as early as move 10. Okay. I don't think we've seen that before so far this summer series. Someone's been playing too much OTB, huh? <laughs> I mean, Good wonder coming back from a from a live tournament here, or a couple, a, a series of. It might be, and you know, maybe Good Wonder is going to try to play on because he has a two minute edge. But six minutes with a piece up is a lot of time to work with, especially for a grandmaster. I don't know if this game is going to go on for much longer at this point. No, I do not uh, foresee too much more drama in this. It would probably take a mouse slip to uh, get Goodmunder back into this game. Right. I mean, maybe maybe the strategy for Goodmunder now is he has to play the opening in reverse and win and win with White there with your uh, you know playing e4 c5 knight of three knight of six e5 and win with the reverse since it's yeah. proved to be pretty strong here, uh, pretty strong here with White. Yeah, and already like Black already has to be careful if he doesn't play knight of six and you know let's say he plays like knight c5 or something. There's all these like queen h5 ideas that are just coming in and just. This is not the start that Reykjavik wanted to, you know, this live club match where... What he's frankly, planning to try is f5, f4. Right. Um, that's why he's made this weakness with h6, g5. He felt like, well, I lost a piece. I've really got to do something. Um, but, I mean, as you said, like a GM with this kind of a position and six minutes has plenty of time to find some good solutions to what's going on. And first of all, excellent by... Uh, by uh, by force and Esteban to just come into this f5 square, which is basically like a weak square. That'll prevent f5, f4. And then queen f6, which seems like it might win control over f5, because if you play a well-intentioned move like queen f3 or queen c2 defending f5, then black can clip the knight on d4, right? So it's not so obvious how you're going to keep control over f5 here. Right. Um, and then he plays f4. What a smart way to do it, right? Yeah, F4. just open up the F file. If bishop takes F5, F takes G5, and he recovers his piece. Um, so F4, basically, it gets his rook involved in the game. It keeps control over F5. It's costing black a G pawn to keep the F file closed. So um, now the bishop can never be trapped. Black doesn't have space on the king side. I mean, there's all that counterplay was just dispelled by F4. Absolutely. And I know the chat is reacting to the mouse slip that we had earlier in the game, but I actually thought it was an important point that we bring up this idea of bishop f5. We also saw black play knight d4 with a very similar idea, you know, maintaining, you know, the static nature of the position by taking over squares where the opponent's pawns are trying to move to. So we see it with bishop f5 here. Obviously, white's already much better, but we also saw it with knight d4 earlier in the game as well, where black, you know, stopped white from playing this move d4 to slow down, um, you know, the nature of the game. So, so far, you know, Interesting positional lessons, just an unfortunate internet chess lesson. Yeah. 
All right, so back to where we are in the game. King h8, f5, taking more control over space and letting the bishop on g3 back out. And uh, yeah, now it's all now it's all looking pretty pretty painful. Um, which might be a good chance for us to click around and check out a couple other games. So I'm going to pop over to um, to uh, Helm's Knight, our stream squad, squatter. <laughs> <laughs> Helm's Knight, who's played several matches already for the PCL and will uh, for the Summer Series, and will be playing two more uh, today. She's got Black here against Optimus. And Helms Knight, of course, a, a top tier, you know, bug house or doubles chess player here on chess.com, as, as we call it. And uh, I think if she had this position in bug house, she would be pretty terrified. I mean, this bishop on d3, Wait, the knight on f7. Are you saying that you call bug house doubles? I mean, they're synonymous here on chess.com. So, really? Yep. Okay. So, g6 here, that's not a move that you want to play. I mean, already there's a lot of like i'm already thinking like bishop takes g6 there might be some potential here h takes g6 queen takes g6 and then just castles maybe even I mean, yeah i mean is... if we look at the position before g6 it looks like something's gone terribly wrong for helms knight right i mean wouldn't you say this position looks amazing for white before we criticize the g6 move yeah i mean this is the kind of position where you know i'm thinking bug house right white plays knight f3 knight g5 knight takes f7 but in this position white also has the benefit where he didn't even have to sacrifice a piece to get right. this far i mean sure black is up a pawn but um you know where this is not the kind of pawn that you want to be up i mean castles is ha happening the king can't castle because a queen takes h7 and mate uh this is this is just yeah. a really tough position here at this point for, for right. black. if someone's wondering why g6 it's because you know it's basically because castles queen takes h7 is so unappetizing <laughs> absolutely so instead we get g6 i mean i would say overall the problem for black here well there's not just one, but the biggest <laughs> problem for black is probably that these queenside pieces don't have a quick avenue into the game, right? They're both blocked in and white has this space advantage from the D5 pawn, which makes it hard to get them organized. The second problem for black would probably be weak dark squares on the king side. So right. she's got her work cut out for her. And um, you know, we talked about mouse slips in the first game, and I think you just noticed it as well. Let's go to move one really quick. Maybe this is a mouse slip and she meant to play E6 here because I don't think F6 is you know, quote unquote, still theory, right? No, maybe F5, maybe the Dutch defense gone wrong. Perhaps. Or There's e6 not quite enough strength, we used to say, like when you had to lift pawns instead of just your mouse. Um, so yeah, maybe just didn't have the strength to get to F5 and then C4, C5. And then this basically becomes like how not to play the chess opening for black at first here, right? Like pawn on yeah. F6 giving up this space. Oh, but this move here is very, very nice. We got to give credit to Optimus for E5. Yeah, E5 is a really strong break here. Right. I mean, you could play G3 to limit the knight on G6 and defend F4, and then Bishop G2 and Castle, and you've got a very good position for white, but E5 just saying like, hey, time to crack. If Helm's Knight took with her knight on E5, she would lose a piece. To queen h5 obviously she sees that i think her only real error was one f6 being a mouse slip and then she didn't <laughs> she wasn't really familiar with what to do with f6 um so she has to give up the dark squared bishop here then retreat the knight to a bad square here white's threatening castles already mm -hmm. uh, attacking f7 so that's where we get this g6 move we saw and you know what now she wants to play d6 and sort of like start to get the pieces out. And white is willing to sack another pawn to prevent that. Bravo. Yeah. And that's where I was wondering if maybe instead of queen h3, bishop takes g6 needed a little bit more time to be considered because black is just so slow getting the pieces developed. I would have at least yeah. spent a little bit more time here. I, I can't say for sure it works. Obviously, the rook's not hanging. You have to take on g6, but castles is happening. Bishop g5 is happening. I mean, mm -hmm. it just seems like there's a lot more momentum here, and you don't have to worry about black's rapid development with d6, e5. Yeah. Um, maybe there was some concern about Helm's Knight getting queen h4 check herself, right? g3 and then queen to h5 or h7, something like that. Right. And uh, right now Black's... Once we've sacked the bishop, we're not ahead in development anymore as far as like pieces that are out. Because <laughs> that's one thing to know when you're like up material, when you're up on development, you're like, I can sack stuff. If you sack too much and you don't even have pieces left to it, to fight with you're not really 
up anymore. And this would seem to cover for black getting the queen out. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, with this move, queen h4, it looks like this position has just become a yard sale. I mean, all of white's attacking pieces are out of the game. And, you know, it looked like bishop g6 there was appetizing for a moment, but maybe the right decision to play queen h3 here. Although maybe bringing it to the f file might have made a little bit more sense. I mean, I don't think bishop g6 is a long term a serious threat if this knight's staying on f7. Right. You go to you could go to f3 so that when you castle, you're on the correct file. You could also go to e2, so you're making it a little harder for black to deal with what's going on on the e file. Both of those moves are pretty plausible. Um, queen h3, you don't want to allow d6, so at least this is a logical follow up with uh, with d6. And now queen b6, it's time to sack that pawn. But I like this move knight e4, though. I mean, this is a pretty strong move. And after knight takes d6, I like what white just did knight f6 check with the idea of rerouting back to d5. When the king has to go to the d file, if you go to the f file, white just castles and there's all sorts of threats on, on the f file. But now, I mean, isn't there like knight d5, bishop g5, or like queen h5, h4 kind of ideas? And like mate is. Queen h4 might be even stronger than bishop g5. Yeah. With the queen e7 kind of follow up. Yeah. And I don't think you can avoid this. I think you have to, I think you either have to throw in the tile or give up the queen. I mean, queen a5, you just play bishop d2 and, it, you know, square one again. Yeah. And to all the general managers in division B, Artak Manukian is currently offering his services in chess.com TV chat saying who needs my help which team which team needs one of the top couple board fours in the entire league to yeah. sneak in with a 21 something rapid rating and play on a top board for their club he played for the san francisco mechanics in group a we had to make a special player card for him which we tweeted out from the pro chess league account and yeah he might become the first pro chess league player to play for like three different teams over the course of one season just based on the nature of these live club matches yeah I popped back over to make sure that business was going as expected for Daniel Force and Esteban. And uh, I mean, he's, yeah, <laughs> he's not giving any chances here, man. Well, if, I mean, you have to give Reykjavik a little bit of credit here for being able to at least get the piece back. So the final position is, you're not as imbalanced. But yeah, I mean, this position is still pretty brutal. Um, wait, am I seeing two rooks for white? Yeah, the, the extra piece has become an extra rook. White has just continued to press this advantage. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I assumed that there would be a rook on a <laughs> given like the natural, you know, placement of the you know the pieces. But yeah, no, this is no great and uh, no good for no good at all for uh, Goodmunder there. Um. All right. So as he continues to do that, um, there is something else that we wanted to draw everybody's attention to, which is the fan prize, and uh, we'd like to announce the winner of the Division A fan prize. Right. So as we reiterated earlier, for every for every group, there's a $250 fan prize for the, the fan who's most involved with Summer Series, is actively tweeting, blogging, and streaming. And, you know, we we, we identified who, who by far was the best fan in Group A. I mean, it was incredible how much he was streaming, and we just had to reward that effort. So um, as we see here, we've got a final position. But congratulations to White, not just for winning this game, but also being our best fan of the Summer Series in Group A. And I believe he's streaming right now with the same username that he has on chess.com, which is Moscatel. Um, mm -hmm. So if you guys want to go throw him a follow, uh, yeah. definitely make sure to check that out. Moscatel has scored a very fast two points. This is his second game, Isaac. I just couldn't get wow. there fast enough. But um, he scored a very quick two points for the Reykjavik Puffins fan club, which has jumped out to a nine and a half, five and a half lead against the Barcelona Raptors, who were the top team in the first week. Are you surprised at all by the scoreline right now? I mean, when we were looking at like just the pure number of players who were signing up for Barcelona, it seemed like... You know, it's 38 degrees Celsius outside right now in Barcelona. Barcelona has all of the momentum. They they need if they get six points today, they basically lock a playoff spot. Are you surprised that they're down already by five? Yeah. Um, in a sense, yes and no. So before I saw the lineups for this fan club, you know, during the week when I was thinking about it and I was looking at the fan growth growth that Barcelona had, they're our top seed in fan growth this week, right? With another 130. You might know these numbers off the top of your head. Yeah, they picked up another 130 fans. Whereas yeah, with another 130 seven. fans, which is crazy for the second week. Um, when, when I saw that fan growth, I thought they looked great in the first week. Their fan growth looks great in the second week, right? Their total club size is up to 376, which is now the biggest fan club in Division B. And it's getting pretty close to the size of the Pandas Club from Division A. A, which is you know also a top four final four team in the pcl um i thought they're gonna run away 
with Division Absolutely. B. That was my prediction before today. When I saw the lineup of the match and how many strong players the Reykjavik Puffins fan club had in play today, I wasn't so sure anymore. Um, right. And it really looks like uh, Reykjavik could uh, upset them in this match. Right. And one thing I want to draw your attention to, you did bring up the fact that Reykjavik did a lot better of a job bringing higher rated players on the top boards. Those games for the most part are still going on. Those games have not finished with the exception of Helms Knight, Helms Knight's accidental F6 mouse slip. You know, those games are still happening where Reykjavik yeah. is really piling on the points. It's all on these bottom boards where let's face it, the matches were a lot more even to start out. So that means that Barcelona has a lot of work to do, not just in the game between Daniel Force and Esteban and Goodman and Kjartison, but in all of these top boards, these games just became a lot more important for Barcelona. Yeah, I'm with you. I mean, if anything, we would have expected Reykjavik to score better on the top boards, right? right. Um, where they have a bunch of really strong players and Barcelona to catch up by having more players, having more players down at the bottom. But um, Reykjavik has scored a lot of points on the bottom boards. Those tend to finish earlier. The higher rate of players use their time um, more effectively. Uh, or the more experienced players are the higher rate of players, right? They've got experience. Right. And they know that if you've got a 10-minute game, you're probably going to play better using eight or nine minutes of think time than, than two minutes. Um, and so we would expect usually for Reykjavik to do even better as the top boards start to end. So... Barcelona is basically going to need some upsets, I think, at this point, like rating-wise upsets to uh, to win this club match. Absolutely. And this is actually like the best possible scenario for Kjartason, considering that the way that this game started out as he, you know, he gets mated here with Queen G7, a nice utilization of the pin there in the back rank. But I mean, that was not a great game for Kjartason. I'm sure he's looking at the fan score and being like, okay, like I can calm down. I've got time to figure this out before he goes into the knockout battles. What's going to be important, I think, for Reykjavik is not necessarily how they're playing in these live club matches, but if they can score points in the knockout battles. We saw Bragi score zero points last week for Reykjavik, losing, I believe, all three of his games to Awander and Dimitri Collars across the board. Um, and, you know, that, that held them back in the standings. So three points only in the standings, you know, that's great. But how are they going to be able to tack on to the, in the knockout battles? And I think this is going to be that moment where we see you know, Curtis and take a, you know, take him, take a breath. If he needs to take a draw this game to kind of like get his mindset, right. That might be the smart decision at this point. Um, but I'm going to be interested to see how he adjusts, you know, given how that first game just finished. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, after a short break, we will be back after a 90 second break. We will be back to uh, see how he does in this second game. For sure. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back everybody to Division B Action Summer Series of the Pro Chess League. Uh, Barcelona Raptors here, if you're late to the show, that official account is being manned by Daniel Force and Esteban, Grandmaster and star of the Barcelona Raptors. And uh, he is facing as white here, Goodmunder Kjartansson 
of the Reykjavik Puffins <clears throat> on the top board in this live club match. And uh, Isaac was just saying that the Puffins seem to have fantastic success so far in the live club matches. They might need a point or two in these knockout battles as well to push them over the top. So Isaac wants to see how Kjartansson can recover from a mouse slip, which basically ruined the first game for him, and uh, see how he can play here in this game as white against Force and Esteban to see, you know, is, is uh, Kjartansson going to be the guy who breaks through for Reykjavik in the knockout format? Right, and I really like his opening choice here with White. It's not super ambitious. He kind of recognized, like, okay, I messed up in that first game. We don't need to be super aggressive in this one. It draws a good result still with White. Um, and I, I think he made a practical opening decision choice here to play knight c3 and just go for, you know, go for this kind of well-known middle game position where White's conceding the isolated pawn on c3 but putting a lot of pressure here on b7. And so he's going to have a you know a pretty simple plan to play throughout, which is great for Rapid. Um, and so, you know, I, I have to say I approve of his opening choice here for White. I, I think that it was a smart decision. Yeah. Um, I often like these positions with the bad C3 pawn. So, yeah, props to him. I've got some follows going on. So every now and then, you know, the wrong board's going to pop up for a second. Like, whoops, Magnus. Oh, just kidding. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so White, uh, I, I tend to like these positions for White where you've got the bad C pawn just because the cost for black was they traded off the knight on d5, which was kind of mitigating the g2 bishop. Once that's gone, there's nothing limiting this guy, and that can make it so hard to develop the pieces on the queen side. If you can't, if you can't develop these pieces for black, I don't care what weak pawns white has. Like your position is just going to be bad without your pieces developed. So, um, you know, if you have to sack b7 and try and you know win back the pawn on c3 or something, so be it. But you really. Um, you're really under a lot of pressure as long as you're tied down to B7. And I, I prefer to play the white side of these positions. Yeah, there's not a lot of like clear ways to develop. I've seen players in this position with black play things like knight D7 and knight B6. But the problem with that is it just, just takes a lot of time. And when, you, when you're already behind a development, you take two moves to develop a knight to maybe a square where it might not you know, belong immediately, that really sets you behind. And I like what white's done. Bishop A3, queen B3. He's going to follow up with putting the rooks in the B and the D file. Um, and that's going to make things really hard. I mean, once you play rook b1, how are you planning on, you know, are you going to play rook a7, b5? I mean, that, you're, you're starting to look at taking a lot of time to do really basic things in this position. Yeah. Um, and by having played a6, Force and Esteban obviously is not planning to do this knight to b6 plan. It doesn't look as good without a pawn on a7 supporting the b6 square. Um, honestly, I've basically never seen black play willingly this a6 structure. Uh, or this a6 you know move or detail against this structure because <clears throat> i mean i guess he did it because he really wanted queen c7 and didn't want knight b5 but normally yeah i guess what would black normally do they would try and set up some way to play like knight c6 or knight d7 quickly so a6 he really wanted queen c7 and why does he want queen c7 I mean, maybe he's worried about the C pawn going C4, C5 really quickly because if White's able to lock down this knight on D4, let's say like players work FD1 and then C4, C5, this is actually where this isolated C pawn is a huge strength for White. We see it a lot in various Nimzo Indian lines um, mm -hmm. where White opens the game um, by simply playing, you know, C4, C5. And I believe like these Fianchetto uh, Nimzo Indian lines, I think uh, Navarra versus Caruana is a really good example of that. And so I think maybe that's what Force and Esteban is worried about. And he's going to prioritize stopping that plan over you know, basic development. I see, uh, I see what my problem was, Isaac. Sorry, I just fixed a little problem there, which is that Moscatel is just hungry for chess, man. <laughs> like after finishing his two games, he's just playing like blitz game after blitz game. So they're always taking over my, my live chess. Um, and he just can't wait for the next live club match between Pittsburgh and uh, Baden Baden. For sure, and he's got a lot of time to kill before that match starts. I mean, that's one of the that's one of the things that happens when you win these live club matches really quickly is you have time. So if you're not sure that you can stay the whole time throughout, if you finish early, you can go, you know, grab lunch, you can go take a break, and go for a walk, come back, and then two hours your next live club match starts. So, I mean, right. obviously he's streaming, he's you know he's trying to you know boost yeah. his viewership, but um, you know for some of these players they're going to use this break time to kind of recuperate and try to figure out what they can do better in the next round. All right, um, as we say that. Uh... I guess Esteban has sort of like uh, revealed his plan is probably to play Knight C5. Um, 
with his a6 and queen c7 play. Um, yeah, I, I like how you said probably with a question mark there because I'm yeah. looking at that. I'm like, do I really want to play knight c5 in this position? I mean, I, now I spent two moves to develop this piece so I can just have it taken off of the board. And then I have to consider, do I want to like lose this pawn on b7? Although here I think rook b8 right. tactically holds, but I mean, there's still other problems here. Um, and I'm not, sh I can't say for sure that I think knight c5 is what black wants to do. Maybe he wants to go to f6, but it just seems really slow. I think maybe black got caught off guard here. I found another problem with knight c5, which might be much more grim than white hanging their bishop on b7. What if white responds with queen to c4 because the yeah. c pawn hasn't yet gone to c4? Then they attack you on the c file here. The queen's hanging. Um, that might be that might be awkward. I think knight e6 is basically the only move because b6 loses the rook on a8. It's gonna go right. knight e6. And now you'll have moved your knight like four times just to put it on c7, which right. I can't tell you why it belongs on c7 at this moment. It seems like, you know, it's it's one square wrong in every single direction. It'd be almost better on any of the squares that it immediately borders. So, right. So oddly, white could trade queens, eliminating one of Black's best defensive pieces, leaving the odd, the sort of awkward knight on c7, then play rook to b1. And it feels like Black's just losing this pawn on b7 in this in this position. On rook b8, white has the move knight to c6, which is complete murder. Yeah, and then knight takes uh, c7 to follow up there even. Yeah. And uh, if he didn't have that, bishop c5 actually wins in that position too. It's just bishop a7. <sighs> I've seen that before. Yeah. Um, and if uh, rook to a7 instead of rook to b8, well, you guys have probably guessed what's wrong with that. Bishop c5 yeah. as well. So Esteban should be having a good long think, but it looks like he's moved. Bishop to f8. That he's doesn't seem very humble. <laughs> Bishop to f8. I mean, white is still so flexible, though. White can still afford to play moves like c4 and just bring the bishop back to b2 if he really wanted to. I mean, obviously the downside is you allow knight c5, but I don't think you want this bishop to be here on f8. It seems like you know you're just you're you're not you're not exactly doing yourself any favors here. I guess the question is, how does white be precise here? I mean, already, I mean, a move that looks appealing is like, for example, bishop d5, but then you don't want to help black by letting him play a move like e6, which is kind of what he wants. Um, so right. he's got to be if, precise here. If you do that, your plan is to play knight e6. Yeah. <laughs> or bishop e6, I guess, as well. Um, bishop takes e6 with fe, knight e6 hitting the queen. Um, yeah, this is, this is still quite good for white even here. I mean, this... Yeah, we're, we're thinking this might be best case for Black if Bishop e, Bishop d5, but it's not even clear. Okay, right. so we see c4, c4 was played. So now, possibly Black could consider Knight c5 because there's no Queen to c4. Um, but one of our viewers was saying that maybe in the Bishop e7 lines, White could save themselves with Queen d5 after Rook b8. But now, I guess the c pawn makes that unavailable as well. We should probably double check this though to make sure we're not missing some tactic like queen a4 hitting the rook, but bishop takes b7, defends it. Um, you just, you got to be sure of these little details. I mean, as commentators, it's not our pieces, so. Yeah, we can make all the blunders and it's, it's more than okay. We can make okay. a blunder or two and get away with it. Um, okay, knight c5 has been played. Yeah, and I wonder if c4 is maybe like the first slight misstep from white. I mean, I, I really like the way that white's been playing so far, but it just seemed like c4 gave black an extra move that you didn't really want to give black at this point. Yeah, honestly, to me, the possible misstep for white was playing rook c1. I thought that rook could be on b1. In my experience, I've almost never seen someone put the rook on c1 to push this pawn. I've seen the rooks go to b1 and d1. And then you push the pawn, and whether it's hanging or not, you don't care. You just keep pushing it, right? And if they right. take it, whatever, you, your piece is just come flowing through the game. So I don't feel like that pawn needs the backup. Um, I'm not sure how it plays into his plan in general, but now I guess force an Esteban... I mean, it's funny to say this when he's got, you know, four pieces on the back rank and like one piece on an actual square on C5. Mm -hmm. But I think he sort of got what he wanted now with A6 <laughs> and this whole development scheme. And I wonder if maybe White's thinking he can just play Bishop A3 to B2 and try to play for like these like, you know, Knight B5 kind of tricks. But I mean, Black can always, you know, have an, this intermediate move of Bishop G7 after Bishop to B2. And I think that he's still doing okay here. I don't think that this is a serious problem. Like Bishop G G7 now, like it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not clear to me like what White's intentions were by going for the setup, which is definitely a lot more slow and, you know, reserved for sure. Yeah. I mean, 
I, I mean, maybe he wants to play knight b3 to break the c5 square. Um, but, you know, it's a little bit of like a retreating, simplifying move that doesn't super impress me. And there's some pressure off of b7. So if black's able to move this bishop, then I think white's big opening advantage will have evaporated. Maybe. Right. Speaking about opening advantages, we talked about how for Kjartisen, like a draw would be a decent result here for white. But let's take a look at that score line again. We're now at 17 and a half to 18 and a half. We talked about how Barcelona needed to get upsets. They are getting those upsets. Oh now my goodness. we're within one point of a tied match again. And keep in mind, a tied match, it's Barcelona who gets that extra bonus point. Not good news for Reykjavik. So how did Gardner's they come back from that? They've got yeah, Coach Alberto who delivered one and a half to one half against UAR Tour. And I saw UAR Tour play in a match previously. That guy is good. So that guy's very strong. Whew. That was big. Silent Thief won a quick 2-0 against uh, Finlay Balcott, which was an important win for Barcelona. That's two points right there. And it looks like it's not just like concentrated on a certain part of the board. It's kind of dispersed all over the, um, you know, all over the scoreboard, which is good news for Barcelona because, you know, they've kind of lowered the number of games that they have in this top half where they're frankly outrated. And they still have some games in the bottom as well where they can get these extra points. Yeah. Wow. This match is going to be close. It's going to be close. And that puts a lot more pressure on Kyrgyzstan here to try to you know, figure out how do I get my advantage back and if it's too late to try to yeah. capitalize on what seemed like a really big opening start. Well, D5 square seems like, seems like a nice little thing to have. Almost surprised he didn't promote his C-pawn to a protected pass pawn there. But, um, but I was thinking about the match score more than the chess for one second, so I would trust his judgment over mine here. I love that unopposed light squared bishop. I love it. Yeah, I mean, that was my immediate, like, visceral reaction to a move like e5. I mean, regardless of if it was the right move, it's almost a move you just don't want to play. And that's why we saw Forsen Esteban spend about two minutes on this move, which, you know, you don't get a lot of opportunities in a 10 plus 2 game to spend two minutes. And, I mean, he's, I don't want to say he's going to pay the price for this move e5 because there's still a lot of chess to be played. But you know, we talked about the dark squares and how weak they were earlier. Now the light squares are going to come into the mix. I would say this bishop should get off of a3. Absolutely. And re reroute to b2 or something because you really don't want to make this trade like if black plays 96 at some point do not trade dark squared bishops um once you do then their knight can be just as unopposed as your light squared bishop it can set up wherever it wants you really want your bishop pair here i think so right and we just saw the move rook c1 to b1 we talked about you know in the opening how the rooks belong on b1 and d1 this kind of feels like white's admitting the mistake just a little bit it's like, yeah. okay, you still have this weak pawn on b6. I'm just going to admit the mistake. I'm going to spend this tempo to fix it. Um, and every time you lose one of those tempos, that, that's advantage black. Um, so that's something we want to keep it, you know, keep in mind. Looking at Esteban's time, I think he knows that he's under pressure here. I think he knows that, uh, that this game is, is all struggle for him so far. Um, how to try and press this for white? Uh, one idea is to move the h pawn up. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw... I mean, we've seen that happen a million times already in the games we've watched. We've seen a wonder do it. We've seen... I think everybody tried that idea at least once last week. I think all four GMs who played played H4, yeah. H5 at least one time throughout the, throughout the night. Yeah. I would not worry about putting my pawn on E3 for white here. I was planning to anyway right. to cover the D4 outpost and just to cover the dark squares because my bishop can basically one man cover the light squares this game. So and I'm curious by this move rook c2 because that kind of a move feels like he was planning to play bishop c1 to try to trade off dark squared bishops with a bishop on h6. Otherwise, yeah, why you play not. rook c2? Yeah. Well, also, I don't know why the rook came off of d1, right? Again, I would have wanted it on d1. So maybe he wants to double rooks against the b6 pawn, but I don't think that's weak enough to really, to really get it. I mean, he's got a chance here to reroute his bishop through c1 to e3 since the bishop came off of h6 maybe that would be a better square for the bishop if he's interested in pressuring b6 that could bring up some tactics uh in conjunction maybe with queen a3 at some point uh for the moment rook b2 is also really bad because of knight a4 um, right particularly bad at the moment okay we'll put the queen on that diagonal similar similar idea of trying to pressure b6 and c5 with some tactics eventually um yeah this is one of the things that i've noticed and i maybe you've noticed this too managing a team is that you know the protest league in these rapid games where there's like a lot of choices but none of them seem to have like an immediate breakthrough it's very easy to get bogged down you know we when we came back to this game 
you know, uh, Forsen Esteban had about one minute and 40 and, you know, Kjartison had about three and a half minutes left. And yeah. we've seen how good Forsen Esteban is in these bullet time controls through that bullet tiebreaker against a Wander last week. Yeah. Um, and this is where like, you know, inability to make decisions quickly is really going to cost you. Uh, and we don't just see that in the pro chess league. We see that everywhere, especially in like blitz where you're playing against a stronger opponent. Maybe you've already lost them before like Kjartison did here. And that is going to create that additional psychological pressure. Right. And, um, you know, here he's just like wasting his whole time advantage, right? And I think yeah. like some other GMs we've seen would have played this move H4 just so quickly without worrying too much. After H5, this has improved things for white. Now G6 and F7 and H5 are all a little bit more tender on the light square. So it's just good for white. But you just play H4 quickly, you know, don't don't take so much time on it. Right, and um, this this shows that he, he wasted a lot of time here playing this move Rook CB2 just to bring it back to C2. I mean, okay, repetition might be okay for you if, if you're playing for the draw, but why spend so much time, you know, going back and forth if you're just going to bring the rook back? Yeah. I think you have to play bishop c1 or queen f3 here yeah. there. This move is bishop pretty bishop. good because um, this introduces the move g4 as well for him, which is not a bad move at all. I think Forrest and Esteban's thinking about playing f5 to really, like, fight for the light squares. We'll see. Yeah, I think you we'll have to almost that or not. Here. Okay, finally that bishop gets off of a3, which I think was never a great place for it. I, mean, the I almost one thing, feel like white should have played g4. I think white needed to. And the one thing I'm looking at structurally is what happens when black plays like f5 followed by e4 really quickly. If white doesn't have counterplay, that's a big positional transformation. The bishop on g7 becomes a lot more pronounced. And that's a lot to process, especially with, you know, a buck 50 left on the clock and, you know, trying to figure this all out. So, um, yeah. I mean, this is this is looking favorable now for, for Sinestaban. Yeah, I think Goodmunder diddled around a little bit there. And and when Black was playing moves like King H7, getting off of the diagonal of the bishop, giving himself the option of Bishop H6, I think this King H7 was actually a very useful tempo that really improved his position dramatically while White wasn't quite doing as much. Um, now F5 before White could play G4. I think I'm pretty sure White should have played G4. Um, yeah. And now it's never going to happen. So, yeah, it seems like uh, it seems like uh, Force and Esteban can quite likely hold this position together now despite the good bishop Ooh, on d5 f4 is really strong oh yeah? yeah and like one thing that i definitely like noticed too look at the amount of time that black has been spending he played king h7 obviously really quickly he probably didn't even calculate the full ramifications of g4 but he could just sense like the nervousness and the indecision from white and knew that if he played king h7 white wouldn't have the time to process like what exactly happens after a move like g4 the position becomes complex um and yeah, I mean, with this move f4, this bishop in g5 is kind of not a player in the game until black decides to break the tension. And black right. can just continue to, you know, put his pieces where he wants to. So he can't get it back out. He would love to come to e3 in this case and do his thing on b6 and c5, but it's too late for that. G takes f4, opens up the opponent's bishop. Um, yeah, and now black's able to force that bishop trade after having sort of trapped that bishop on g5. And uh, Black's position seems okay here. The light sword bishop kind of hits nothing now. So, Absolutely. Now it's Bl it's White who's going to be worried about Black playing g5 at the right moment. If he's able to get like a rook on g6 or a rook on g7 with that king naked on g1, that weak h4 pawn there as well. This king on h6, if like he can avoid any sort of like queen g5 checks here, is actually like a pretty strong defender despite the number of pieces that are on the board. Yeah. And this position is uh, in anything can happen territory. I would say 30 seconds each with, you know, a bunch of tactics still available, both kings a little bit open. All right, he's going for rook f5. I would have tried White. to maybe played like queen e5 there or something, try to put a knight on e5 where you have a more active knight than the, you know, the bishop is useful. But he wanted to keep more pieces on the board and not trade queens because he wants to, you know, try and win this position with like a g5 kind of attacking idea like you were suggesting before. I think maybe black with this move. Oh, there goes the queens. Yeah. I don't think he wanted that. Is bishop e6 playable? Is bishop e6 playable? That's worth five or ten seconds of your last 30 seconds to double check. I agree. Right. And I think with that move, rook f5, what black wanted was to play knight f6, knight g4, rook which he can still play. Now. Yes, rook f6. Good job. But I think white's actually ultimately happy now with this endgame transformation. You've got this weak pawn on b6 for forever. You can't really move your pawns on the king side forward. White's king is going to get active really quickly. 
I mean, it might not be like extremely better for White, but this is better than the position we had about five moves ago. Oh, but he just hit him with a knight fork. And this happens yeah. like every time you get like a time scramble, it's like a knight fork. Maybe G5 here is good too. Um, I think these two players are moving towards draw territory. I mean, I think it might be the smart decision, although maybe Black, yeah, I thought he would take here. Then Rook A5. Or Rook D3, Rook A3. So he's got A3 or H3 now. I think Black's winning. I think yeah, now, Pawn's winning this. Yeah, now it's actually... Once the Knight Fork came down, nice. Force and Esteban, I've noticed, he plays the end games pretty fast, right? Yeah, I mean, he's really he good at these, what he needs to do. these technical end games. And, like, he noticed the recognition there. It didn't actually do him any good to win that A pawn because if the H pawn is able to trade off for one of the king side pawns, that's actually a theoretical draw. Whether it's G or H, it doesn't matter. But in this case, he's got two connected pass pawns on the king side. And, you know, that indecision from White earlier is going to be what ultimately costs him this game if, if uh, Force and Esteban gets a second point here for Barcelona. Yeah. Well, I think he's got it. I think he's got the second point. And let's see what the what the club score is. And I think it's a little bit too oh, little, too it's late. too late for Barcelona. It's 27 and a half to 18 and a <laughs> half. The Puffins have closed it out while we were watching this end game. Yeah, and the Puffins man, have oh, just been extremely strong, you know, on all of these boards. I mean, they allowed a little bit of a comeback surge in the middle of the game there, but Force and Esteban, you know, he, he wins both games, but, you know, just like a wonder last week, it, you know, it doesn't do, it doesn't do you any, any good against this uh, Reykjavik Puffins team. No. Nice win for the Puffins, the Puffins, the Puffins. So that means that heading into the knockout battles, it's the Reykjavik Puffins who are on top of Group B. And I went back and I looked through every single pundit's prediction of, yeah. you know, who they thought would advance from Group B. And it was almost unanimously Baden Baden and Pittsburgh. And now Reykjavik's on top of the group. And I think people are going to start looking to the Reykjavik Puffins now to see if maybe they're going to find their way through. But they need a, they need a strong knockout battle performance here first. And, you know, I'm sure that, you know, they'll be prepared for that as well. I don't think they need a strong knockout performance. They need some knockout performance. I think right. even third place would be a good sign for them in the knockouts. If they can win all their live club matches, they probably only need one third place. But um, we'll be back in a couple minutes with the, uh, with the knockout battles, and then we can see um, if the Puffins can make their breakthrough, if Goodmunder can do it. See you on the other side.
premium membership at chess.com will help you improve your game with full access to a powerful set of learning tools. Unlimited tactics let you practice like a master with more than 50,000 puzzles to challenge you at every level. Our library of interactive chess lessons created by master coaches will enhance every aspect of your game. And after each game you play, the computer analysis feature will give you feedback on every move you played, turning every game into a chance to learn. And that's not all. Premium benefits also include unlimited tournaments, video lessons, the opening explorer, and much, much more. Upgrade now to take your game to the next level. Whoa, we're back. It's almost knockout time, Isaac. Yeah, and that means that we're bringing in both the bottom, bottom snowballs and the Pittsburgh Pond Grabbers as they make their claim in today's knockout battles. A really interesting result here. I mean, we've seen Reykjavik yeah. now upset two weeks in a row. We haven't really seen any other team pull off an upset, but Reykjavik's two out of two so yeah. far in the Life Club matches. And, you know, that's probably not the result that both bottom, bottom and Pittsburgh wanted to see. It would have been much better if Barcelona had just gone ahead and won and then did really well today in the in the knockout battles, and it's just a battle head-to-head -head between Pittsburgh and Baden-Baden. But this means that next week it's going to be a lot more contentious for sure. Yeah, I mean, you're thinking like if you're going for second place to get into the summer series, you'd rather one team just run away with it than that uh, that uh, all the teams be bunched up together. Then it's like more risky that you could get first place or fourth place, and you'd rather just have a really good shot at second. Right. And the other thing to consider here as well is that Daniel Force and Esteban, like he, he won both of his games. He's going to be a favorite going into the knockout battle. So the chances Agreed. of them getting zero is very low. What does that mean? That means that if they're going to score points, Reykjavik already has three points. There's not a lot of places left for Baden Baden and Pittsburgh to do really well. And one of them will lose the live club match. So for both Dimitri Collars and Alexander Shabalov, who will be playing in the knockout battles, this is the do or die moment. If you get zero points in this knockout battles and then you'd lose the live club match, your summer series could be over today. So it's really important for both of those players to step up, do really well. Uh, Kjartison is obviously going to be the underdog in every single game that he plays during the knockout battles, and that favors both Collars and Shabalov. But yeah. you know they, they're going to be playing each other first in this knockout battle. Both of them have to go for the win. There's you know there's no you know wiggle room on that. Yeah, I think um, as you say that like your your sort of season could be over today. I think Baden Baden has two more points than Pittsburgh right now, so um, potentially they could do okay in just the knockout or just the team match and they'll still have a shot next week right if they score two to three points today overall but pittsburgh is the team which is really really on the brink of sort of like elimination as far as like being one of the top two teams that automatically gets into the playoffs um because they've got that one point and uh going into today the bottom bottom team had more fans right so that means that uh dimitri kolars is going to have the sort of like white advantage against Shabalov in the first round of this knockout um, as the two seed versus the three seed. So he's going to have that white advantage in the 15 minute game. Then if they go, if they draw and they go to a bullet game, he's going to have the draw odds advantage there. So I think you would imagine that he's at a comfortable or, or a significant favorite actually in that little one game mini match. Obviously anything can happen in a single game, but you'd think he's the favorite there. Similarly in the club match, um, you know, if they're if Bottom Bottom got more fans this week, then the Pittsburgh fans really need to turn out. I mean, they've still got a good sized club, and uh, you were just telling me that there is some chatter in their club, that there is some some life, some pulse this week. Yeah, I mean, they've definitely been a lot more urgent, and I think the thing that Pittsburgh fans realized, like a Wander had the best individual performance last week among all four players, hands down, three wins, three draws, no losses. But they only scored one point, and they are on the like potentially on the brink of elimination today. Now, going back to the individual pairing between Collars and Shabalov, the one thing I will say is I don't think Shabalov minds having black. He loves playing enterprising chess. He's going to play theory that Collars has probably not seen before. So if Collars <laughs> plays e4, expect knight c6. If Collars plays d4, expect literally any opening in the opening book. Shabalov has done six on move one. That's where Shabalov's at now. You think? Shabalov's been playing that and has been scoring really well in the pro chess league. I know last season wasn't oh. his season, but he's beaten players like Vladimir Fedoseyev. He's beaten players like Basem Amin. He beat Gadir Gusenov and a really crazy Karol Khan line. He's able to play basically any sideline in the book. 
And that's why I think the color might not matter as much for the 15 plus two game. I think where the color matters is going to be the draw odds favor. So if, if the game ends in a draw, Shaba, I don't know when the last time he played Bullet was, but that's the one that I think Pittsburgh fans are worried about. So if Pittsburgh okay. can get a win in the knockout battles, they give themselves that safety net uh, yeah. going into the live club match. And I think they really need it. Yeah, I mean, when you talk about a wondrous performance last week, if he hadn't been fighting against draw odds, he might have won the knockout, right? Like, he was eliminated because of the draw odds, because he had to play black in the 15-minute game. If the odds had been in the other direction, if Pittsburgh had had the bigger fan growth that week, he might have won the whole knockout, and they'd be sitting on three points instead of one. So um, so that, that fan thing is really important. And looking at the sizes, I believe the Pittsburgh fan club is still the second biggest fan club even though their fan growth has been a little bit smaller, um, they still have this big established club. They need them to show up. Um, and that's where the intrigue really sets in because as of this morning, the last time I checked, bottom bottom in Pittsburgh are exactly level at 350 fans a piece. So okay. at this point, it's hard to really judge who the favorite's going to be. We knew that this would be the marquee matchup of today because yeah. both teams need a win. Now, I think Collars it, has a little bit of wiggle room, right? He, you know, Barcelona beat, you know, frankly destroyed Baden Baden in the last live club match. But Collars was able to ultimately come through, get his revenge against Daniel Esteban in like that frankly crazy middle game and score three points for Baden Baden. So if Collars does well today, Baden Baden is still in a good position, but it's all about that first knockout battle. Yeah, I mean it feels to me like Pittsburgh had the bigger club and Baden Baden is the one catching up. I think the people who have most recently joined your club are the ones who are most likely to be playing in the match, right? The people who joined your club yesterday or in this past week are the most likely to show up for that club. So I'm going to guess, predict that we're going to have slightly more players for Baden Baden this week than for Pittsburgh. Um, That's interesting that you say that because, I mean, you know, considering, you know, both teams had really big losses, I think both teams were favored going into last week. I've been following both teams trying to figure out which team is going to do a better job turning around, encouraging fans to show up. Yeah. Pittsburgh by far has done a much better job. They've been active on Twitter again. You know, they've got people streaming today for this live club match that are fans of the Pittsburgh Pong Grabbers. Uh, I know Artak Manukin was somewhere in the chat there saying, like, I want to play for the team that's on bottom, which is the Pittsburgh Pong Grabbers. So I think there's a little bit of momentum in terms of the Pittsburgh Pong Grabbers. I still think bottom bottom is a slight favorite just because of how well they did during the Protest League finals. But I think yeah. it's a coin flip. I don't really think that there is a clear favorite going today. You just play for your favorite team. You play your best chess and whoever comes out on top they've got a really good shot at moving on to the Summer Series Championship. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it sounds like Pittsburgh's done all the right things, but if we see that growth from bottom bottom, and then we wonder if maybe they're doing something sort of like under the radar that's also like really good. Like, I don't know, maybe they're organizing like person to person at chess clubs around Germany or something. I don't know. I mean, that kind of grassroots movements is exactly why Barcelona is doing so well in the Summer Series despite being relegated, right? And so that's yeah. totally within the rules. And if they're doing that, yeah. hats off to bottom bottom. But we'll find out. Right. If that's what they're doing today at the live club match. Maybe that will something start... that you didn't see on Twitter. We'll see how they turn out. Exactly. And that will start about 10.30 a.m. Pacific time for those of you guys watching. But first, we're going to have the live club matches, which should be yep. starting relatively soon in just two minutes. So let's do, let's do some predictions here, right? Since we're talking about you know, the potential outcomes for each team. So on the All left right. side of the bracket, we've got Goodmunder Kjartison playing again against Daniel Force and Esteban. Yep. That's on one side. And on the other side, we've got Dimitri Collars versus Alexander Shabalov. Who, right. who do you have? So let's start on, on one side, on the, on the easy side, shall we say. Daniel Forrest and Esteban, he was second in last week's knockout. He's a very strong performer in the uh, PCL in general. And uh, he just beat the same opponent 2-0. Now he's got white, and he doesn't have to give the guy a rematch with black. If he does, he gets draw odds in that bullet game. Uh, he's got to be like 80% to advance, so he'd be my pick. Yeah, for sure. And then I think in that individual matchup, I think, you know, I think Ingvar is in the same room with Curtis and watching the game. He's probably giving him the pep talk right now to say, look, man, like we know you're the underdog, but all you have to do is just get one point. You just have to get to the next round. Right. Yeah. And so I think all you have to do is get one point and I won't give you a beating. Right. And I think the thing to notice here is like Curtis really only played one game. There was an unfortunate mouse slip that, you know, could yeah. frankly happen to anyone. So we have a sample size of one game. I think Curtis yeah. draws the first game, loses the bullet tie break, you know, not having the draw odds because we've seen how good Daniel Force and Esteban is in these bullet time controls. So I'm picking Barcelona to go through. All right. So then in the other one, we've got Kolars. Um, the games are about to kick off. We've got Kolars against uh, Super Blyce, the uh, Pittsburgh player, Shabalov. Who do you have there? 
I'm picking Alexander Shabalov to go through. I mean, we've seen Kolar's kind of struggle when he doesn't know the opening theory, especially against Daniel Force and Esteban. I distinctly remember that first game that they played in the live club match last week. I give Shabalov the go-ahead with Black to upset Dimitri Kolar's here. All right. Um, and I would uh, go with the favorite by by rating Dimitri Kolar's. Um, I rely on performance ratings for my predictions, as as you know very well, Isaac. Of course. So I just I just look at their performance rating in the PCL over the last two seasons, and uh, I pick Kolar's. Uh, so that means you've got a rematch of last week's knockout battles really quickly. I've got who a are, rematch of last week's knockout. Who are you feeling this week? And that's another thing I do is, like, I see, like, who won last week, and I'm like, they won, they'll probably win again. You know, it's like well, when Carlson not plays a Kobe, right? It's like it's Carlson won the last tournament. I think he'll win the next one. Then something happens with Nepomniachi. But anyway, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so I would, but I think I'm going to go against my own approach or whatever. And I'm going to say that Force and Esteban gets revenge against Cole and this week and wins and it that's my for too. Barcelona. I mean, I think they need it after losing that, that club match. I think. I think Force and Esteban knows they need it. Um, I think he played quite well today in his first two games. And, uh, you know, he's seen what can happen when you try too hard to win against Kolars because he basically lost trying too hard to win with his white game. And maybe he'll accept a draw if he needs to in the 15-minute game and then wrap it up in the bullet this week. I think that would be actually a fairly good strategy. But just in general, I mean, I think now that he knows how good Kolars is, he can avoid sort of underestimating him and he can perhaps, you know, use his, use the full advantage of that bigger fan club and the uh, draw odds this week. Right. And I'm picking Force and Esteban to win this over Shabalov and, you know, in my kind of prediction of the knockout battles. And the reason why I'm picking him is he's on the hot seat. They just lost a live club match, a zero point week or a two point week puts you in danger of not making that cut. So he's on the hot seat, but he's got momentum. And I don't think we talk enough about momentum in the Pro Chess League and how valuable that is for individual players. We see players lose early and not able to recover until the last game where they play like the fourth board. But we've also seen players do really well and just go for four for four in the Pro Chess League. I think today's going to be Daniel Force and Esteban's day. I have him beating Shabalov in my knockout battle pick. Cool. I'm going to answer one question from chat um, before we finish that up, but that certainly makes sense what you said. We've got a question, what to do with the Bishop on F8? And I think Goodmunder has just sort of revealed what he wants to do with the bishop on f8 by playing c5 i think he's saying he wants to put this knight on c6 um that's why he developed the queen knight to d7 i mean it was also the only square available at the time but you know by playing knight d7 and then c5 it leaves room for the e7 knight to come to c6 and then bishop f8 can get out of the way of the crowded back rank and uh black can get everything in order um, yeah, and one thing that I would like to point out here is just the opening choice for both players, right? Daniel Force and Esteban realized that he's doing a better job managing these chaotic positions than Cardison, so he plays e4 instead of c4. Cardison realizing that, hey, maybe today's not my day, I'm going to play solid, I'm going to play the move c6 and move one, and we're yeah. going to take things slow. A draw is okay here. I was so focused on the uh, <laughs> on the predictions that I missed this like mind blowing moment that Force and Esteban <laughs> has played something other than c4. Um, Maybe he was worried about that C4, E5, Knight, F3, E4 line. Maybe he wasn't that familiar with it, and he thought, if there weren't that mouse slip, I'm not sure what I would want to do with that opening. And so he switches it up and goes into E4. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's a bit of a surprise to me in terms of the opening choice. I didn't, uh, I didn't see him deviating. I mean, I don't think that this was specifically to avoid that E5 line that we saw in the first game, because remember, Force and Esteban's really good at switching between D4 and C4, so he loves these Catalan positions as well. If it was purely about getting out of book, he would have played D4, but I think he just wants that chaos. He wants to play E4 into a standard E4, E5 game or go straight to a Sicilian where things are going to get chaotic. He's going to play an open Sicilian and try to blow the position open. So, um, wow. So the trade on C5, Knight comes to D4. Uh, here, h6 comes in handy for black because they might need to retreat that bishop. Also need to watch out for bishop to b5. In some cases, probably black can handle it here with rook c8 and stuff. So maybe bishop e4 next here. Keep that bishop. I guess he maybe didn't even need h6 now if he can go to e4. Yeah, bishop e4 looks you know definitely possible here. And I'm surprised the players are thinking so early, you know, given that you know, this is a fairly common structure for a Karakon. Like, I'm not an E4 or a Karakon specialist, so I have no right to talk in that regard. But from what I understand, like, I've seen, like, the C C6 to C5 idea dozens of times for Black. So I feel like both players should be in their comfort zone, maybe just, you know, taking that extra minute to try to figure out if there's any deviation that they can play here in a rapid game. 
Yeah, maybe checking some details. I mean, maybe this is not like the number one opening in their repertoire. So there may be like there, I would assume that there's no GM in the world who's not familiar with like the basic Caracon slash French pawn structure we have here. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how that could be. Yeah. Um, but, you know, still just checking some details, um, you know, picking between G6, H7, E4, um, you know, could depend. Are you surprised by bishop g6 at all here? I mean, this was probably like the third candidate move that I had for black in this position. Yeah, mildly surprised. I hadn't thought about the position hard enough to like be totally surprised. Um, you know, you have to have to really have an opinion that you're that you strongly hold before you can be surprised by something else. But uh, I was kind of thinking there looked like there was nothing wrong with going to e4. Yeah. Um, it just you know, has some extra possibilities to take on F3 in some cases because of the E5 pawn. And I didn't really see any sort of downside to it. Um, I've even seen black play G5 in these Karos, although usually not with C5. Usually it's either C5 mm -hmm. or G5. So once he played C5, I thought, okay, this bishop's coming out this way. But, you know, in, in theory, bishop E4 keeps open that option as well of running the G pawn. Yeah, for sure. Should we take a look at our other game, considering that 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 might have the biggest influence on the standings considering you know yeah. where the, the way the players could go well you got your I, open sicilian i told you that, you, that we were going to get something sharp here should we take a quick look to see what shabalov picked this time yeah let's click through and see which sicilian he played looks like a rouser cool I'm actually that's, a little bit surprised that he's opted for something that's a little bit more within the realm of common theory. I mean, I've watched Shabalov play, you know, more than any other player in the Pro Chess League, I think. I mean, he's played for the Pittsburgh Pong Grabber since 2017. Mm -hmm. um, and this is probably one of the more mainline openings I can say he's definitely played with Black. So interesting yeah. to see how he's going to handle this position. Yeah, this definitely falls within what I think of as main chess openings. Um, I, I think this move, knight f3 on move 10 by Kolars, is actually quite a quite a good move. Um, there's a thing in the Sicilian where when there's a bishop on d7, the player with black often wants to trade on d4 and then bring that bishop to c6 once mm -hmm. they're ready. And um, sometimes right at that moment where they've played bishop d7, you move your knight away uh, and avoid that trade, even though there's other Sicilians where you try and maintain the knight on d4. I mean, that's why right. I like open Sicilian. It's like a nightmare. I mean, there's... People who don't even play e4 because they're so scared of how hard it is to play the open Sicilian. Um, but I think knight f3 makes a lot of sense here. Leaving that bishop kind of stuck on d7, right? Technically developed, mm -hmm. but not active in any way. Um, now on b5, he's going to trade. The d6 pawn is like truly hanging here. Often you'll see black players sack the pawn on, on d6. Um, you know, and then maybe counterattack with bishop c3 or queen a5. But um, here with d7 sort of hanging and c6 barely holding and white having e5 next, uh, it doesn't look like the best case to make this pawn sack. Yeah, and that seems to be the main idea behind this move knight f3 because when avoiding that trade, that bishop's not going to, that bishop stuck on d7, whereas it would have been on c6 before and black would have been a little bit more flexible uh, right. in this kind of pawn sacrifice line. They might be able to unta untangle that kind of position. Um, so, now, immediately following up with f5, white obviously can sometimes try and explode things with e5, other times play f5 to fight for the light squares. Having given up your dark squared bishop positionally, you usually want to attack the light square. So if you've got sort of a slower game, you want to play positionally with f5. If you think you've got a shot to finish the opponent with a big lead in development, you just crack them with e5. But Shaba's development is fine here, so yeah. f5 is played positionally. Right? And it's that fight. For that light square here. Nice knight on c4. Ooh, and e5. Interesting. Here, here comes something interesting from Shaba. And I imagine he's got minute, a think. range of options here when he went for d5, right? Yeah. I mean, this rook could go to e8. The other rook could go to c8. He could play for h5, h4. He could do a number of things i imagine so i don't think in any way he was positionally forced to try this pawn sack he wanted this well i mean shaba wouldn't play any other way right i mean now you could argue that he's opened up this e7 bishop so collars always has to keep an eye out on like knight a3 tempe and intermezzo kind of ideas mm -hmm. uh, 
And I would argue that maybe even though you're giving up the pawn, it's it's not too bad to give up the light squared bishop here you know, in exchange for the bishop on h3 because now you can put the rook on c8, you can double up, you can play rook d7, rook c7, um, and you give yourself a little bit of flexibility there. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because normally white would want to trade the light squared bishops, right? They want to break up black's bishop pair. They want to get to work on squares like f5 and e6. So in a weird way, Shaba's like sack, like from one perspective, which misses part of the story, but from one perspective, he's just sacrificed a pawn in order to achieve white's positional goal right. of trading the light squares, right? And if you look at this position, look how weak f5, e4, and e6 are. In theory, if white had a knight on one of those squares, you'd be like, oh my lord, look at that piece. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think part of his idea is that this strong knight on c4 is kind of isolating this d5 pawn, and he's planning to win that pawn back super fast and have a strong pawn on e5 before these white knights can get organized into his weaknesses. So he's got ideas like knight e3 and rook d8 and knight e3 and knight e3. Yeah, there <laughs> we try go. And get back this pawn on d5. Um, and Collars is immediately testing that with this move knight c3, trying to rush that knight over the e4 square and at least try to make some sort of statement in the center to, to punish black for, you know, for the move order here. Yeah, that seemed like basically forced, like the only move that has anything to do with what's going on, right? That defends d5, that doesn't lose the pawn back to knight e3, that looks to get into the weaknesses. But now Shaba's saying, hey, look, the other stuff I have is this dark squared play on the queen side, right? There's bishop a3, like you mentioned, there's queen coming to a5, there's knight takes b2. Um, so while the knight's on c3, it's super vulnerable on this dark square, super vulnerable on a dark square. Once it gets to e4, it won't be defending d5. So like if Kolars plays knight e4, then knight e3. And I don't know what he would do next there. Yeah, for sure. And this actually reminds me of a game that you actually analyzed in one of your video recaps for the regular Pro Chess League season, which was Shabalov's win with Black against Gadir Gusainov, where he played the Karo Khan, but you know, very quickly sacrificed upon the center, brought his rook over to the c8 file and just immediately went ham on this b2 square. Um, and so, like, for me, like, as someone who's watched Shabalov play again, like, you know, these all are ideas that I've seen him play before, and I know that Shabalov is comfortable in this position. So the pressure's on Collars right now. These next five moves are going to be the most important moves he plays all game. All right. He's doing something traumatic. Yeah. He's doing something traumatic because he was under a lot of pressure. So I think... I think we can already evaluate whether or not d5 was a good move. I think, honestly, I would call it brilliant, Isaac. Yeah, Just double like, x clam. I've never seen this before. So that's one thing, right? It's like you could play like a brilliant move, but like everyone's played it before. Like b4, b5, and the queen's gambit exchange. You're like, minority attack. He's a genius. <laughs> but like, you know, the genius was Akiba Rubinstein, and you're just like 100 years later right. playing it, right? But d5... I've never seen this in this way. I've never seen, like, sack the center pawn, sack the light squares. I haven't seen it. Yeah, I mean, it's truly original. And, you know, I think this move d6 from white is kind of a concession. Like, yeah, this was a good idea. I'm going to play defense now. Yeah. We have even material, so I'll take that, right? Like, it feels like a concession. Now the initiative swings back into black's favor, um, yeah. you know, after, you know, pretty intense opening in the Richter Rousers. So, yeah, I have to say I'm like really impressed. I didn't see this D5 idea at all. I mean, this was this was quite strong. So let's say what's Collar's idea with D6 other than just like, ah, right? Because <laughs> like a GM's always got a little bit more going on in their brain than just pure, ah. Um, right, I would hope so. <laughs> so I think a big part of it is by losing the pawn, he's going to open, fully open the D file. Once the D file is fully open, then Black doesn't just have their time in a closed position to take shots at b2 they can't right. just take their time and play like queen a5 queen b4 while you sit there going like ah <laughs> um so he's going to be able to open this up then that means maybe rooks get traded on the d file he takes away some of that fuel for black's attack on the king side if black tries to avoid rook trades and move all the rooks to the c file then at least his rooks are super powerful on the d file so i think um we'll see his queen coming to like e4 f5 maybe Maybe f5 knight e3 is too bad, so maybe his queen's coming to e4 or something. Yeah, but, but he's e4. Look to try and take some of the material off the board here. Right, but with e4, you already have to worry about like, okay, rook takes d1, rook takes d1, does knight a3 work, for example? Are you okay playing b takes a3 and allowing rook takes e3? Do you have to play knight takes d1 here to avoid that tactic? I mean, now this is where the test really happens to callers. And one thing that like I've personally been working on to become a stronger chess player is in these kind of moments, 
like if black can recognize you know before going down all you know before going down this route if he can realize trading the rooks off trading the queens off and getting to a minor piece end game he's already better right so the test is now up to callers to make sure like these kind of simplifications don't happen so there's not just the burden of trying to stop a queenside attack there's also the burden of making sure you don't accidentally walk into a completely losing end game well, now he's not losing the ending after boldly yeah. grabbing this pawn on h7. Uh, he's leaving some pressure on Shaba to deliver in the middle game by grabbing that pawn, right? Yeah, and with this kind of move, queen takes h7, you know, it's going to become very double-edged really quickly. I would not be surprised if this game ends in about 10 moves. I mean, this, this is about to get shorter. Or five. I mean, yeah. he's like asking for rook, a, rook d1. I'm already saying a3. <laughs> I always like misspeak when I'm thinking when I'm thinking the variations like 10 times faster than I can speak, right? Absolutely. But he's already got to think about rook d1 followed by bishop a3. Yeah, I mean, this is this is strong. The one downside though, the bishop a3 though is, you know, it's starting to play bishop takes b2, but you know, it's still a little bit slower. So if white can play something like rook d7 or like oh, yeah. knight d5 and like try to get involved in the position, that makes things a little bit more complicated for Shaba. Um, right. So right. there taking, is some precision required now. Taking the pawn on b2 might be too slow, right? It's like, well, you're not threatening checkmate. You're just coming in and capturing the pawn in front of my king. I don't care. <laughs> I mean, that's the kind of position that we have, right? I mean, Black's yeah, already yeah. given up, uh, you know, a pawn to just to be here. So a pawn doesn't necessarily seem that bad for white. Yeah. So um, what else could we see? We could see like knight takes b2 here in theory. Might be a possible move. But if knight um, takes b2, maybe Black's e white's even okay just playing queen takes e7 and just saying, okay, take my rook, see if I care. Yeah. Like he might even be at that point because without the dark squared bishop, how are you going to attack on b2, on c3, on a3? Your queen is actually yeah. like in this position, you wish you didn't have the b5 pawn. Like, I mean, just to show some crazy moves, right? This kind of thing yeah. could happen. And uh, now black basically would have to attack down the files, right? Since they only yeah. have rooks and queens. I guess that makes sense. <laughs> so, right. <laughs> you're looking at a move like queen c6 or something or queen c5 next. Um, queen c6 might have tactics on this diagonal. Queen c5 yeah. would have the idea of rook d1 check at some point. Um, depending which way this goes, um, yeah, funky and intense. Yeah, and I think the players are doing a good job of recognizing that the game is going to be decided because of this position, and so it's okay to be spending two minutes here because yeah. you know if you make the wrong move now and you spend two minutes later, you're probably already lost. So Shabalov's doing the right thing, and I expect whatever Shabalov plays, Kalars is going to respond by spending about two minutes and double checking everything because a single mistake in this position, the game is over. Yeah. All right. I think we're mostly going to stick with this game, but while um while Shaba's having a good think here, let's just pop over for a second and see who's who's coming out in the other game so far out of the opening with a nice position. So last we saw we had the knight trade on or the pawn trade on c5, knight to d4, and Esteban immediately plays c4, trying to blow open the center some more. So one of the things in this variation of the Karakhan is Black sort of does a lot of fiddling or maneuvering to get their bishop outside the pawn chain to play c6 and then c5 like they're trying to arrange this huge positional advantage it's costing them some time so right a lot of times you can challenge that positional advantage for black by playing c4 for white interesting knight trade on c6 which leaves black still with the strong center well i'm not super clear on what um on this maneuver that uh, Daniel Force and Esteban just did with queen a4 to f4, but uh, my overall valuation would be that black's position still seems pretty solid here. I mean, maybe white's idea here is to play for queen g3, and if black plays like bishop back to g6, there's already h4, h5, because the queen of the knight would support the h4 square at that point. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think Curtison does have to be a little bit precise here. You can't just make like any waiting move. I think you need to address you know, this issue, because like, let's just say black passes, Queen g3, bishop g6, h4. What are you going to do if you're black? If you play h5, that g5 square becomes really weak, and you need to fully understand, like, all right, is this the kind of you know position that I want to play at this point? Um, you know, I think I think that that's the main challenge here is Cardison has to find a solution for that, but he's got the time. I mean, he's now three minutes up, uh, and that's you know that's a big positive now at this point. I think for for Cardison out of the opening. Yeah. So. Um... Yeah, so black could be looking at rook b8 here. He could be looking at just trading off a piece, maybe on f3 here, just to simplify some of some of what's going on here because trades are often good in this structure for black. Hey, and David, um, I think we should probably go back to that Shabalov game because he indeed. played a move that neither one of us you know, even considered, which is just to play b4. So he goes for b4, leaving the bishop on e7 hanging. So um, 
basically we're at a point where everything is is possible, right? Like white could leave the knight hanging. Um, if white moves the knight to the wrong square, one of the main ideas of playing pawn to b4 is to play knight a3 check. Yeah. Um, I imagine you've seen this this story before at some point in your life, but knight a3 check, if they take, the point is to checkmate. And I'm pretty sure this one's on puzzle rush now. <laughs> And if they don't take, then the idea is to take on C2. You want to make sure that you've got a secondary threat if they don't take, like that you're actually threatening C2 or something. Because right. if you play knight A3 check in a position like this, your opponent plays king A1 and C2 is like completely defended, then like, why is your knight on A3? Right. You chase the king off of the B file, which sort of like helps them. If you now retreat like knight C4, knight B5 or something, it's just, it's bad. So the preconditions for knight A3 are two fold. You have to have the checkmate set up on the B file if they take, and you have to have C2 hanging, basically. Yeah, for sure. And I actually like this decision of playing B4 more than any other move that we were looking at. The more and more I look at it, for example, if queen E7, that's the critical line, right? So yeah. if queen E7, B takes C3, how is white going to realistically deal with all of these mate threats while yeah. also like maintaining any sort of material advantage? I mean, at this point, black already has like, gotten his piece back, and he can afford to play... Can afford to play dynamically here. What did Black? It's just like Kolars has made a move, probably Knight A4. But let's just show why this doesn't look very good. B3 would stop Queen B2 mate. I don't think there was any other move. And mm -hmm. then there's Knight to A3. If yeah. C1 Queen E3 is the detail that um, you don't necessarily have every time in this structure, but that's just done. It's game over, right? So that would force you know King A1, which allows Knight takes C2 with check. King B1 Knight back to A3 king over there and now you can just trade off the rook and push the c pawn and it's it's winning for black absolutely and we talked about these on games before i mean in this case you just have the pass pawn too and okay rook takes d6 ah, so Kolar's played another move he traded on d6 to get one rook off the board first i don't think that that is a bad sign for shaba at all um because now the bishop's not hanging on e7 and white you know conceded the trade instead of having the trade happen where his rook on h1 comes back in so Right. That's perfectly okay and for Shaba. One, one key detail there was, some of the viewers might be wondering, why didn't Shaba just play knight a3 check? That c2 pawn, because the queen stayed on h7 and didn't take that bishop, is actually protected by the queen. So there's all sorts of intermezzos where you play knight c2, and a queen takes c2 stunner, and your queen's still hanging. So yeah. that's why we sell this move queen b5. Also, anytime black's queen is under attack, and this comes up on the next move as well, you can't go for knight a3 pretty much, because after pawn takes, pawn takes, check. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they just take your queen with the <laughs> rook too. and yeah. they don't move their king. So um, it's the same reason I was saying that white has options to play like a move like knight a4 or knight d5, whereas they can't play knight e4 basically right? because um, of knight a3. So bishop d6, now um, Kolar's got his knight to d5, which I guess he deemed was better than the a4 square. Mm -hmm. um, and that's probably why he traded the rooks first was because he wanted his knight on d5. And now he's got to defend his knight <laughs> and hopefully not lose to knight a3 check at the same time. Seems like a tall order. I mean, this is... Doesn't it? This this feels like the kind of game where Shabalov gets two points in the standings for the Pittsburgh Pong Grabbers just by going to the final. Just um, by going to the final. Is it possible to play rook to d1, and now that there's not a black rook on the d file, accept the knight sack and run with the king for d2? I guess the, the idea now is that because you played queen b5, there's no longer queen e3. But is there queen b2? And the knight on d5 covers it too. Is there queen b2 followed by rook c2? I mean, this is the critical... Oh, oh. right. Oh. <laughs> I mean, it's desperate, but you got to find like your last... You have to find it. To ...hang on to when you're in Kolar's position here. That knight on d5 also does a really good job of grinding the c3 square. That, that's it's gonna... covering a bunch of sick things that could happen to you, right? From queen e3 to bishop b4 to queen c3. Although with bishop b4, maybe we can try to play bishop b4, knight takes b4, queen c3 there. Although I guess king e2, and you're actually still perfectly okay if you're white because you have in to... In fact, you're happy to run at this point. Yeah. I, maybe the last key thing here would be for black to take on a2, creating a second thing for white to cover, the a pawn from queening and the king from getting checkmated, right? When you hit the knight on d5, and then you know your idea is to just keep playing. But if white plays queen d3... It certainly feels like white has chances of covering everything. Yeah, and queen takes a6 is actually about to become like a really serious threat. That queen on a2 is actually, it's important it's on a2 because it stops rook b1, but you right. don't want your queen on a2 behind, you know, behind the, the pass pawn. Yeah, like, queen I guess in this case in front, but... Queen d3 has actually trapped the queen almost, which needs to get out of the way of that pawn. So it might be, it might be tricky. Let's see what he does. Queen d3 was played here. Um, 
okay, as opposed to rook d1, which we'd been just been wondering, could he allow knight a3? So now on knight a3 check, he also has the defensive resource of queen b3. That's the other thing you got to work out. Right. Like knight a3 is all well and good when you checkmate somebody in a flashy three moves. But you have to understand there's like 50 different defenses to it. It doesn't always just work. <laughs> right, and he could have even just taken on b5 there from d3. All the things and, that could uh, go wrong. Right, the queen is attacked as well. So he can just take the queen as well. So you have to have, you know, b2 has to not be defended by a sneaky p bishop on c1 that allows king a1. They have to not have a piece that can block on b3. They have to not be attacking your queen. So... It's not so easy to to make it happen. I like this move f5 though. It's a very mature decision because so many players I think here would just want to like go 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 with the with the black pieces. And now you know there's all these ideas of e4 and f4, and White still has a lot of problems here. What's happening now after e4? Yeah, actually, this is really gross. <laughs> um, is he planning to sack the queen? Knight c4. Pawn takes queen knight d6. But now there's like queen c6, right? And now you're threatening c2 and you're threatening f3 and you're going to win back the, the, the knight on c8. This has to be just completely winning for Shabba. Knight c8, queen takes f3, winning. Yeah. With or without taking on c2. Um, e4 was played. Queen d4. Oh now, my goodness. So now his, knight point, his point is pawn takes knight, he's got knight takes knight, and then queen d6 check. Jeez, Kolars, this is this is sick. And if knight takes on e3 first, he'll take on d6 with check and then save his knight on f3, probably, like That's... to d4. Yeah, okay, so what this other is options? by a thread, but that's a nice thread, queen d4. Wow. Okay. And there's also the point that bishop c5, that just leaves the c4 knight hanging, so you can't even move the bishop on d6 anywhere useful. Yeah, if he didn't have this, he would also lose to that. <laughs> um although even there is bishop e3 okay for for black yeah. or did you just have this pass pawn on e4 oh it's definitely this is definitely playable for black this position here um after losing the pawn it, it could still be totally playable the white king is always sort of boxed in yeah right? on b3 there's always bishop d4 the b pawn stop a3 or c3 you can definitely play this as black um do you, do you win it or do you have the advantage? I don't know. You may even risk losing it. If you play f4 here, knight to g2 might be super annoying. I'm going immediately after the f pawn with the knight because yeah. I don't know how else to fight this. Like, <laughs> And you can't really be slow with black. If you play like rook c5 or rook f8, white just plays rook f1. Now he's getting his pieces into the game and that white does have material playing. advantage. I was like, I don't know what to do other than attack this f pawn. Try and sap the strength of the e pawn before it gets even further. Yeah. I mean, black could play bishop d2, knight f5, e3. But can't you sack the knight now and just knight say, d4. okay, win rook versus bishop? It's hard to see how black's going to win this, right? Once white gets the knight back to e2. Yeah, I mean, there's that too. I don't know. There's That's definitely some pressure on Shaba to deliver now, right? He did not, I don't think he saw this coming when he played e4. He just thought e4 looks good. I'm going to go for it. Maybe he's blundered. If not, it's still a good move. Yeah, um, and uh, Kolars had planned this queen d4 idea, so that's a lot for Shaba to to figure out. And he he's used going it for the end game time there. Use it most of his time. Now he could think about trading queens as well if he thinks the f pawn is even better than the e pawn. Normally you don't want doubled pawns, but look and at this pawn on f2. That's actually really strong. I see Georg Meyer there playing guess the move, and uh, he's one for one. He maybe needs a little bit more time to figure out what what's going through these players' minds. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is already like there's various Ricky eight ideas. Okay, you don't want to allow 97, obviously. Actually, it's very strong. Okay, well, the thing is, he can play f2 and on yeah. knight d7, king a7, for example, knight c5, rook c5, rook e1, rook f1 would lose to again. I'm I'm ahead of myself, would lose to <laughs> rook e1 three moves from now. Wow. Um, so he's actually not really threatening knight c5, he's threatening this pawn. And he's planning to put his knight on d3 as his defense. That's going to attack the f pawn so he can threaten to take it. It's also going to stop rook e1. And it's going to stop rook d1, right, by blocking that file as well. So the knight coming to d3, that's Kolar's big defensive plan. Um, yeah, for Shaba, I mean, it's definitely been the game of like, man, I wish I had fewer pawns. At first with the queen side attack, you didn't want this pawn on b5. And now this pawn on f5 is actually maybe even a deterrent from black if he's trying to play for a win. 
What? 97. After, wait a minute. Does he see this? Are you like, kidding me? He okay. traded it? That night was so good on D3. Yeah, I mean, it was really good on D3. I actually liked White's chances there. And now after like Rook E, F4. City with F4. So nice. G King's F4. Or, nice. oh, he's, he's trying to trade off everything, everything on the queen side to uh, on the king side <laughs> the side without kings mm -hmm. that was called the king side um in order to get a draw yeah and a smart decision there by shaba realizing that okay there's still another game after this if i if i can't pull this off and uh this is definitely not the semi-final that we deserved in this knockout battle i mean uh yeah this is this has been probably the most exciting game that we've seen so far this summer series i think if, hands he, down. if he'd given one more tempo then then colars plays rook f1 and just wraps up the game like it's over. So F4, right. very, very good. Let's check in on the other game for a second, right? Because they've also got 50 seconds each. We haven't seen it in a while. Um, it's still I've, a recognizable pawn structure. Yeah, and I've actually been keeping an eye on this game on my other screen that I've got up right now. And, you know, once again in this game, Daniel Force and Esteban has had a minute for most of the game. But, you know, Goodmunder had about three minutes edge at one point when Voice and Esteban was in this time control. Again, this, you know, when you're indecisive in the protest league, you're just not going to score points. And it's all about that trend, right? I mean, right? I mean, like White it's has like, like decisive moment, Isaac. Yeah. B4 is just going to be game over. How does he how does he get out of that? Normally you'd move your rook to a square like C7 where on B4 you could play knight A6. Yeah. And now he's just going to play A3. I mean, just put the pressure back on black again. Black's very clearly uncomfortable. Queen takes A5 is also good. Yeah. Yeah. I think he Oh, but there's Ooh. also 96 as well as B4. I remember I was thinking about that before. So and we should go back to the uh, Kal Kalar's game against Shabalov because Shabalov has actually just resigned. What? Oh, my oh, goodness. Oh, he lost on time. Rook F5, Rook F2, King E3, and he resigned he here? Or, no, he no, lost he on time. time. Oh, that's so unfortunate. I mean, oh, that's but he doesn't know what moment. to do, right? Because if Rook H4, Rook F2 covers it, and if Rook yeah. C4, Rook F2 covers it as well. So, so that's like how to win with uh, with defense by Kolars that game. My goodness. And so it looks like your predictions might you know might actually happen here. We'll get a rematch of last week's knockout. Four about. seconds left, but um, 96 did win a piece. Okay, so 96 happened. Knight takes e6, d4, knight takes c5, of course, right? And if pawn yeah. takes queen, knight takes queen, he's up a piece. So it's just an extra piece for force and esteban a situation which he's now familiar with today i mean he had that same material balance <laughs> yeah i mean he's proven himself time and time first again in these time scrambles I, I just have to say i'm completely impressed with the way that he's been playing both of these weeks so far yeah queen e5 nice centralization use that e pawn to end the game use check oh, that's, a smart, one. Move. That yeah. a smart move. that's where he ended the, the his other white game as well was queen g7 checkmate right um so dominating from him, very, very tense <laughs> game for, uh, for Dimitri Kolars to get his rematch against Force and Esteban. Um, very, very scary. But that is the white side of the Sicilian. I mean, you could say he had a minute and a half left at the end of the game, whereas everybody else in this knockout was down to like, you know, zero to three seconds. Right. And he I had two extra pawns, and maybe maybe Kolar's had it all handled. I mean, I don't think he saw this move D5, like his opening theory preparation. But what I will say is, like, in this game, Shabalov proved why he's a U.S. Chess Hall of Famer. But in this game, Dmitry Kolar has proved why Georg Meyer gave him 61 games during the 2019 Pro Chess League regular season and was a key player in the Pro Chess League finals against the St. Louis Archbishops last year. He last gave himself frame. some of those 61 games by getting bottom and bottom in through all the playoffs, right? I mean, that's Absolutely. where they racked up an extra, like, you know, 20 games. Um, because Kolars was like had the biggest gap between his performance rating and his PCL rating that he was counting for, right? So in a sense, like usually Georg Meyer is in the conversation for MVP of the PCL because he's like a board one who plays every single game for his team, gives everything he has, right? But I think mm -hmm. that either he or Inna, their co-managers, they were interviewed at some point during the finals. And uh, he said, like, I think like maybe our MVP this year was uh dimitri kolars because of that performance rating gap that's what i would say too i'm the performance rating guy so i would have also said like hey if you've got a 25 30 cost and he's performing 26 30 throughout the regular season this guy's plus 100 that's that's your mvp yeah and it's always like really interesting to kind of look at the stats on this and especially with younger players i mean it's very rare that you find such a big gap on like a board two or a board three kind of player where they're very high rated we see it a lot more in board four 
where they may be like 2100 feet a but performing at a 2400 rating level yeah. but what's been interesting for me watching Kolaris play throughout the 2019 season is you know I've had players on my team who are about 2500 perform at about a 2700 rating level for the duration of a season but over time that number goes down because just the amount of variance you know it, it decreases right. right like you get closer and closer to your actual performance rating that has yeah. not been the case with Kolaris I mean with 61 games like, that's a big enough sample size where you know that he's going to constantly overperform his rating and he's probably underrated over the board as well yeah yeah, and probably for next season, his FIDE rating is going to is going to go up a little bit as well. I mean, it already has gone up a few points, but um, but his performance, but his performance in these in this rapid format in this online league is even higher than his increasing FIDE rating. So he's still going to be a pretty valuable uh, piece of uh, Bon and Baden or or whatever team is is lucky enough to have him in the future. So, so let's make some picks, right? We've got a big final now. Barcelona really could use a win here to make up for losing to Reykjavik. Bottom, bottom, a win would be a life insurance policy for this matchup with Pittsburgh. And then we've obviously got the Pittsburgh and the Reykjavik game on the other side. So let's start with the third place game and move our way up. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I think Shaba looked brilliant in loss. Is that fair to say? I mean, I've had games that I lost and I thought I was brilliant. So I'm going to say the same thing for Shaba. I think he looked brilliant in this loss. He was full of great ideas. Um, could have beaten a lot of GMs with what he came up with in this game. And uh, I, I see him winning the uh, third place match. He's also got the white pieces and then Big the draw plus. odds if there's a bullet. So, I mean, again, I think he's like 80, 90% favorite. Yeah, I mean, the key is to just recognize that you just played a great game. Kolar's just played a better one. And, you know, so be it. This happens. It's chess. But he's playing against an opponent who's, you know, we could argue is on tilt. The only thing that you don't want to do with the white pieces there is feel like I need to just do everything to play for a win. You know, play practical chess. You're going to get there. We've seen Shabalov. You know, play positionally and tactically with white. I'm curious to see which way he'll go. I'm picking Shabalov to get the third place finish as well. Yeah, which would leave Reykjavik with two live club wins and zero knockout points after two weeks. So they'd still be right at that middle ground, six points. They could finish like number one in the division or number four, depending on how the last week went. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think that's like they'll be in this funny position going into next week still where anything could happen. Uh, and then here we've got uh, and then we've got the top match. And I think you and I both said previously, we think that Force and Esteban is going to get revenge this week. Anything changed after seeing those games? I mean, Kalari's played in a really impressive game. So if he <laughs> wins, like, I'm not surprised. But here's what I'll say. Force and Esteban yeah. is still a little bit, you know, he's warmed up, right? He had that first game, which was a gimme game because of the mouse slip. And yeah. then he kind of warmed up. He had this opportunity to kind of figure out how exactly he wanted to handle these time controls. I want to see what his first move is here. Goes back to C4. Repeat yeah. of that first round game that he played against Kolaris last week where he won. For those of you guys who missed last week's broadcast, Kolaris did lose to Force Nesman in the live club match, but then got his revenge in that knockout battle, which is why Baden Baden has three points in the standings right now. So Isaac, do you think, um, like reading into what you just said, do you think that it's a small advantage to play the first match for your knockout player to play two games in the live club match before playing the knockout series like Kolars is going to play his two games in the live club match after this knockout do you think that 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 warming up is uh, a small advantage maybe i think it depends on like how close that live club matches right we saw at a brief moment barcelona looked like they could overcome the deficit and then ultimately got blown out so even if you know force nesman didn't win that last game let's say he just blunders and loses to cardison in that last game that result ultimately doesn't matter. So he's got a couple basically, you know, opportunities where he's able to make, you know, make a few moves. If he blunders, it's okay. He's got the knockout battles, which are ultimately going to focus on him. So right. it's a little bit of an advantage there. But if the, if you have to win the live club match, that's that's a whole different story. And I think we're going to see that with Pittsburgh. If Pittsburgh and Bottom Bottom had played first, it would have been a lot of pressure on both of those players, you know, to to basically win both of those games and get points for their teams because we're expecting a level match in that one. Okay. So not every single time would you favor the warm up, but probably more often than not, it would be a you would rather play first if you had a choice. Right. I mean, it also depends on how good like your overall like you know club is, right? Like if you've got a poor you know fan club and you don't really get your fans out and they, you wind up losing most of your live club matches, that mm -hmm. puts a lot of pressure on your GM to do well, right? That that's where Force Force and Esteban is now. But if you've got a big fan club, I'm thinking teams like Chengdu and St. Louis, they thrive when they play first because players like Akobian or Zhang Di or you know, you know, all of their strong players, they get to warm up, they get to get ready for these games. So uh, that's where that difference happens. And, you know, it's in the spirit of the competition, build your fan club, you get the advantage and you see these small edges materialize over the course of the day. You know, Baden Baden could actually leapfrog both, uh, both Reykjavik and 
uh, and Barcelona and end up in first place after uh, after this knockout if Kolar's win. I don't think and then, and then they win the uh, their club match against Pittsburgh. They have to win the club match. I they think they have to also getting... win their club match. But it's possible that they could go from third to first in the next right. hour and a half that we're here. <laughs> and, you know, when we were putting, you know, we were kind of like doing the draw for these groups, like group B was the group of life. And, you know, let's, you know, let's, let's have chaos, right? If Baden Baden beats Barcelona, yeah. but then Pittsburgh beats Baden Baden in the live club match, you've now got five points for Pittsburgh. You've got six points for Reykjavik. You've got six points for Baden Baden. And you've got seven points for Barcelona. That's a tight field. Anybody's going to move through on that last week. And it's all going to be up to who wins those live club matches. I thought things might clarify this week. I thought Barcelona, um, before I saw like what a turnout the Ra- the the Puffins had again, I thought that the Raptors might win their club match against Barcelona. I expected a good performance for, from Force and Esteban in this knockout, as we're seeing right now, and I thought they might just like de- decide the division today. And it would really clarify the picture, right? Like if they ran away with, you know, eleven points in two weeks, they're basically <laughs> sure to be first place, and then, you know, also by beating the other teams, it's sort of clear where those teams fall but actually it looks like after this week all four teams are going to be in contention yeah and actually i agreed with you like i thought that barcelona will come out today the clear front runner runner i thought they would beat reykjavik i thought they would you know win this you know overall knockout battle after thinking about my picks for a little bit Uh, and i thought they would ultimately lock their spot today but you know we have a lot more of an interesting situation because if reykjavik potentially wins all three live club matches but finishes fourth in every single one of the knockout battles we know from group a that that's not enough you need to at least score a point or two points in one of these knockout battles have that chance if you're going to win all three of your live club matches. It might be mathematically possible for all four teams to end with exactly nine points. That's they possible. They first through fourth, and then it would just go down to like fan club. They'd just be counting fans till August to find out who's in the playoffs. Right, and if that were to happen, then both Barcelona and Baden Baden are very happy teams at that point. Barcelona would be first, Baden Baden would be second. Pittsburgh, I believe, right now would be third. Reykjavik would be fourth. And that yeah. would be a tragic way for the Puffins to go out, considering the way that their fans have treated you know, the team. Right. Their fans played so well, the but their numbers were slightly smaller. Exactly. Um, we've got a classic IQP. This is one of one of the... well. They used to call them tabias. I don't know if people use that word anymore, but this is one of the opening positions that has been seen like the most in like, you know, master play for a hundred years. Um, this IQP here out of an opening that it can come from the English opening, as we saw in this game from Force and Esteban. It can come from the Queen's Gambit declined. It can come from the Tarash. It can come from the Nimzo. It can come from the Pan of Botvinnik attack in the Karo. So, and as you can see, I'm not naming openings like the rat, these are, or the orangutan. Like these are all openings that get played a lot. All of them can lead to this. This position has come up a million times. I've played it with both colors. How about you, Isaac? Do you, do you have experience in this position? I mean, admittedly, like I played the Queen's Gambit decline for an extended period of time and I hated playing against the IQPs, but then I also hated playing with the IQP because I like to play more of like a positional style game. Um, so eventually like I figured out like, okay, what kind of trades do I want to work through? Um, the book, written by the Minnesota Blizzards player, Mauricio Flores Rios, does a really good job talking about like the IQP and like which colored bishops you want and how you want to maneuver around the IQP or how you want to play against the IQP. So for example, if black were to somehow be able to get the light squared bishops off of the board, that's advantage black because now this dark squared bishop is not going to be able to cross back and forth around this IQP as easily. So um, there's a lot of you know small, subtle theoretical notes, but uh, if you learn how to play the IQP, you have a very good sense of how classical chess is to be played. I learned this stuff from a book by Alexander Baburin um, called Winning Pawn Structures, which basically only talked about the IQP or the hanging pawns, which can come out of it. He's like, winning pawn structures. There's only one pawn structure you need to know. <laughs> it's the IQP. Wait, was he for the hanging pawns or was he against the hanging pawns? Both. I mean, it's just sort of like, it's like what, you know, how does it work or not work for either side? It's just every maneuver that the side with it could use or the side against it could use. Uh, it's just a fantastic strategic book. But um, here, I mean, bishop a4, this is like a typical maneuver. Once the bishop's been blocked on g6 and e6, sometimes you swing it to a4 and try and fight for control over these centers, central squares on this a4 diagonal. Um, so, yeah, I mean, what I prefer doing, if possible, is, you know, playing like rook takes e6, f takes e6, queen takes g6, and then brilliantly uh, winning. <laughs> right. But, um, yeah. Uh, Looks like Kolars is not allowing that. So Esteban has to play the whole board here. Um, 
when Kolar says he's going to play b5 to deal with this bishop, Esteban immediately plays knight e4. And you know, he's saying like, hey, <laughs> I know where the structure is headed. I'm going to c5 next. Right. right. As well as having an eye on f6 for the moment. So um, we're going to see like a high level positional game here. C4 and C5 outposts for the knights. The rook on C8 may favor Kolars in that fight. All right. I kind of have to say I like black here. I mean, just the placement of the knights makes a little bit more sense to me. White's attack on the king side has lost a little bit of its direction, and now you've got to be worried about you know potential dark squared bishop trades allowing knight F4 as a possibility for black. Mm -hmm. And this bishop on B7 does a really good job of you know. You know, covering the d5 square, but also playing on the long diagonal. And I'm actually more worried about the white king on g1 than this black king on g8. I can tell you when I lose on the white side of IQPs, it's often because of this knight coming to f4. Because I'm like trading the dark squared bishop to weaken f6 and h6, but like sometimes it just doesn't quite go right in terms of the details, and they can play knight f4, and it's just awkward enough that, you know, I lose that advantage of activity, which you normally associate with the player with the IQP, that little bit of extra activity. But if knight f4 hits at the wrong moment and you get kicked to the back foot, then the game will like really slip away from you. Right. And I think that's what Colors is counting on. I mean, they definitely have, he definitely remembers their encounter from last week playing against the same opponent. And how did that game start? White had a slight advantage from the opening and he pushed and pushed and pushed, but then he pushed too far and lost a piece, right? So I think Colares made a really good decision against uh, you know Esteban today. And it's going to be interesting to see if they play again next week, if there's any additional preparation beyond that. Yeah. I'm looking at... I'm looking at this and starting to really like um, Kolar's position. I noticed that until thinking on this move here, Esteban, uh, Daniel Force and Esteban had more than 13 and a half minutes. So yeah. he had like a four minute time advantage, which says either like really confident or just choosing to conserve his time and not put that effort in. And then you look at the position. If you're feeling Black's position like I am, then you're thinking like, hey, maybe that was a good three or four minutes invested for, for Kolar's because... I've heard a lot of these GMs say that like the opening position you get is actually super important in these rapid games. Cause if you can get like, if you can be the one with that small advantage and then you're basically playing a 10 minute game instead of a 15 minute game, once the opening's over in a 10 minute game, if you can just keep that small advantage, it's very hard for the opponent to play and very easy for you to keep sort of like a safe, small advantage. That's actually really interesting that you say that because when I talk with a lot of board fours and board threes from around the league, they say the, exactly the opposite. The opening doesn't matter. All that matters is you have enough time to win in the middle game. So it's very uh -huh. interesting to hear the difference. And I think maybe yeah. it's all about which openings you pick, right? Like this is obviously a very, you know, historic setup. This has obviously got a lot of opening theory that comes with it as, as a result of that. But some players who specialize in openings like the Tromp or the London system or the Verisov or the Jabava attack, like there's no theory there. You just make moves and then you get to the middle game and you have a time advantage and your opponent's trying to figure out what the best moves are. So you know, I feel like yeah. that is true if you match it with your opening pick, right? Like right. if you want to like, have a super important opening position, then you have to be super booked up. If you don't care about, you know, the final opening position because the middle game is more important, then you have to pick an opening where there's maybe not as much theory and you know that your opponent's not as prepared for it. Right. I mean, I want to just say it's like the board ones are probably right and the board fours are probably wrong. Oh, for sure, right? Because like, <laughs> yeah, we're talking like 2,600 GMs <laughs> versus like 2,150 players. But actually the point you make is much more interesting and and correct like there are some openings where the where the moves don't need as much thought to reach sort of a normal position and others where there is more pressure on you like the opening that we just saw Kolars and uh and uh Shaba play last game obviously investment in the opening and getting a good position was important at the same time we saw Kolars have the time left to find like the tactics to navigate that that really tough middle game so yeah for sure I don't know and a little bit of both you know, it's interesting that you bring up that maybe the, the board ones are right there. And I think in principle, playing against another GM, I think you're right. But we've seen all of these board fours do really well in the Pro Chess League. And that comes to mind is Nika Volkov for the Tbilisi Gentleman. Yeah. He thrives in these kind of positions. Chaos in the opening doesn't matter what he plays, but he beats yeah. GMs, right? And yeah. so... Often without of, getting a good opening even. Like, exactly, the GM's right? got the advantage and he still, like, comes up with something. So when you have these board ones, I think the board ones might be right because they have to treat all of their opponents equally, but these board fours, when they go in haphazardly and they're willing to take risks and they're willing to do so without right. spending a lot of time, that creates that imbalance that it might actually decide the match rather than the board one getting the expected score of three or three and a half out of four. Yeah, that's true. And like that board four, I mean, may only need to score one two, out of four, one, one and a half, half, two out of four. So they may only, 
need to have like the time to recognize one opportunity. They don't need to like squeeze every single game and win every single game. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, what do you think of All this right. decision of F5 here, F5. right? Now getting back into the chess. <laughs> now this bishop's on the correct diagonal for that. Black has yeah. stuffed that diagonal with knights. So I don't think the bishop on A2 is going to be a huge problem right away. Although we should keep our eyes on it. You know, sometimes one yeah. or two trades happen and like, boom, oh shoot, that guy's killer. <laughs> Definitely... If he were anywhere on the board, you would now want to reroute him to A2. It is the ideal square, even though the knights are blocking it. Right. Um, but yeah, yeah, F5 just gains space. It's often used to stop kingside attacks. White wasn't really threatening a kingside attack here. So how is black going to handle? Yeah, so this is what I was worried about. And I think we, we do a good job here bringing the audience's attention to that. This E6 pawn is a backwards pawn in the center of the board. And... Sure, you can play bishop to c5 and you're protecting the, uh, the pawn on e6, but you give, you give up the bishop pair in doing that. And that's not everyone's cup of tea. Sure, I mean, he's you give getting, up the c5 pawn, but. Can you knight, get this pawn? Knight e5, maybe c5, b3. b3. Queen c5, b3. Is there a trick here? Is there a trick here? I'm not sure I see the trick. The queen's defending the bishop on a2, so you don't really have queen a3, pawn takes c4. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really see a trick. So knight c5, bishop c5, pawn c5. It looks like you can't really take that pawn. But that means that c4 knight's under pressure. Can black maybe play e5 here with the idea of e4? Maybe that's Kolar's mm -hmm. idea. Right. I mean, you're weakening the king. It's so like... Sack terrible. a pawn on c4, right? Then play e4. Right. And now the black pieces are great. Maybe, think, maybe something like that. He just played something. Let's see what it is. Yeah. He traded on G5. Well, that's surprising because that leaves this <laughs> monster knight. Yeah, I, I, this was the move that I, I least expected. In fact, I was wondering when white was going to play bishop takes E7 and, you know, use exactly. the fact that knight takes E7 is not what you want to play if, you know, white's able to play moves like knight G5. But Yeah, I was also thinking when F5 was played, my first thought was like, well, we'd like to trade on E7 to play knight C5, but then black won't recapture on E7. They'll probably play FE4 hitting the knight on F3. Yeah. And that, that was the first thing I calculated. I can't save the bishop and the knight for white. This doesn't work out. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, if I can't play bishop takes e7, what's he going to do? Then by then he'd already played knight c5. So I'm shocked to see this move here. And so I guess what's the critical plan? question is, is like, how are you going to recapture with white, right? You have two reasonably appealing options. I mean, h takes g5 is, you know, going to kind of point out the fact that f6 is no longer a square for this d5 knight. You're controlling the dark swords, but knight g5 is also quite strong, putting pressure on e6 and h7. Yeah. Really quick, let's cover one tactical point. The move knight e6 looks playable. Intermediate move hitting the queen. If rook e6, then queen e6 is check, and you've got time to recapture. The problem with knight e6 is bishop takes c1, because if knight c7, rook e2, and you're still just out of material for white. Yeah. Um, so knight e6 is a nice thought. I commend anybody who's looking for intermediate moves. Props Absolutely. Guys on that. But I think here we do have to recapture on g5. If knight g5, maybe black can play e5 then. Yeah, and that's what I was worried about. And that's why I was leaning maybe hg5 makes more sense because black gave, you know, got rid of this dark squared bishop. You control the f6 and h6 squares. You don't rule out the idea of a kingside attack later. If you put your knight on e5, you still have maybe an option later playing for g4, as crazy as that may seem. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, playing more or less the long game here, you do have a time advantage. So yeah. um, maybe. Knight f4, we have to look at that, right? That's the thing that I always get wrong. I'm like, black's under pressure here. Black's weak on the dark <laughs> squares. But I got to remember knight f4. Knight f4. Like my weakness, Isaac. Um, so what does white do next if black plays knight f4? You can't play queen e5 here. Don't hang, don't hang the queen to, to the knight on c4, which is unfortunate right. because... These knights are covering an awful lot of your, your stuff. I yeah, mean, now knight takes g2 is actually quite annoying, you know, if you're not careful. Right. So, I mean, the queen could come to f1, but then black has possibly the option of bishop takes f3. Yeah. Takes f3, queen e7, queen d8. I don't know, to keep e6 defended by the rook, maybe. And this is like, this is how I've lost before, Isaac. You'd think I would remember it better, but. Uh, right. And speaking exactly. about lost before, Pittsburgh has actually just beaten Reykjavik. That game is over before we even got a chance to look at it. Which means that Pittsburgh finishes just third. happened, but yeah, let me pop over to what you're saying. Oops, that's not it. Oh man, twenty move game. We missed. We missed the savagery. Yeah, I mean this this bodes well for what we've got in store for this live club match, which just started about ten thirty a.m. Pacific time. 
Um, yeah. And again, a Carol Kahn from Reykjavik, which is a really interesting choice here. All right, so B takes A4, Knight A5. I'm just clicking through some of this real quick. It was an accelerated Kara where Black played both C5 and G5. We talked about how, well, we didn't explain why that doesn't usually both get played, but we mentioned briefly in the other Kara that it doesn't normally both get played. I don't know why, but maybe this game tells us a little bit why. Mm -hmm. um, Black's both opened up the center slash queen side a little bit and made pushes on the king side, so his king would be uncomfortable if it castles there. He wins the pawn on e5. That's the strategic goal. Now he's up a pawn, but um, his king is open. There's pieces dangling. Rook c4. He drops a rook. And uh, yeah, well, white's, white's up a lot of stuff at that point. Yeah, and I think this is where not doing opening preparation and you know prior to you know prior to every Saturday really hurts because Shabalov has actually played the Kirokhan on numerous occasions with black. You feel like you'd be comfortable playing against it with white. Yeah. Um, and here he is with a free point for, well, not free, but an easy point relatively for the pawn grabbers, which was a much needed point after losing to Kalars there. So they're going to be at two points heading. Yeah, it's only their second point, right? So he just doubled, he just doubled their tally for the moment. So yeah, this definitely. He's already got to G2. Kolars is in business, man. And I think that means we were just wrong about F5. We completely underestimated the, the potential here. And I think Force and Esteban made the same assumptions that we did because now Knight takes H4 ideas are, you know, in the air. Certainly. <laughs> like I, I, I'm nervous for Esteban here. And I think our picks might actually wind up being wrong if he's not able to, you know, you know, make this work out. I mean, Knight F4 <sighs> is a good back to F4. That's so evil. It can come to H3 yeah. at some point. I guess it's covered for the moment, but this knight is so good, Isaac. I mean, well, we magically commentated this correctly, right? Because as soon as we got the IQP and you were talking about if the dark squared bishops trade, and I was like, the way I've lost this with white is if a knight comes to F4. And look at this knight. It is sick. I mean, nice outpost on C5, but um, this knight is so tough to, to play against. Yeah, we mentioned earlier, we were more, way more concerned about the king on G1 than the king on G8. And even our initial concern with F5 wasn't the king on G8, it was the E6 pawn. But, you know, in opening up the position, it's opened up this king on G1, which is obviously the much greater concern. So let's just play out some moves to get an idea of what's going on here um, together. So we'll trade a rook on E8. Then we'll trade a bishop on C4. Bring the yeah, queen I mean, to C4. Every move you play with white has to be forcing or else you'll have H6. So and now black plays great. bishop D5. And our forcing move has turned into us getting forced. Yeah. And now hanging over us are knight E2 and H6. Um, Kalars, right. that's, Kalars um, might be your next Akobian if, if, if this were to occur. I mean, the next Akobian, the defense <laughs> of Akobian. I mean, he's winning these games by like the counterattack, right? Right. Or the pure defense or counterattack. There's just so many options here. I mean, let's let let's go the other way, right? If White doesn't play actively and like plays rookie one, which is obviously a bad move, Black not only has h6, there's also queen c6. It's possible in that position. And now, how are you stopping queen g2, mate? Hmm. hmm. I can stop after one move with d5, queen d5. Um, so, but d5, queen c5, I mean, if I'm down a piece, it also doesn't matter if I stopped mate very much. Right. Um, he you can play might have rook, to play f3 at that point. He could play rook e3 here. Sort of a surprising move because the knight can't actually take it. Um, if black were so foolish as to trade on e3, then you could deal with the knight finally. Um, and you give an extra defender to h3, and you've got the idea of playing rook g3. But let's see. Esteban, Daniel had some time to think. He played rook e3! Oh my god! Oof. Okay, so hold on a second. If rook takes e3, f takes e3, is there queen c6 maybe? Or is there just e4 there? Well, I don't know. Our queen's covering the checkmate on g2 at the moment. Is queen h1 one mate? H1 I take this. A threat. Queen h1, king up. Queen g2, king e1, rook e8, knight e6. Oh. I mean, this doesn't look healthy. This I mean, there's, not still look queen, healthy. there's still queen g3 in this position, too. I mean, yeah. what's to say that black doesn't at least have perpetual here, right? Right. Oh, they definitely have at least perpetual still. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. at will. They've got queen g1, queen g2 and stuff. Um. Okay, well, that's scary. I don't know if that would hold up for white. Let's see if there's any other alternative after queen 2, c6. Does knight takes b7 stop mate now? 
because we've opened the second rank so there isn't queen g2 in response. Oh, there we go. Okay, so... We trade this. That stops queen h1. And then black really needs a big move because we're planning to actually take that knight. Yeah, and the problem is you can't move the c4 knight. I mean, it's funny because we talked about how great this bishop on a2 was the moment that black played f5. So it's all lining up uh, in yeah. terms of all of the positional you know, elements that we discussed. Oh, this is a worthy knockout game, huh? Championship game. Yeah, I mean, if Kolaris manages to win this, I mean, this is probably the most chaotic route to winning a knockout battle. First, that game was Shabalov, which could have very easily gone either way. And right. this game, of course, in Esteban, which just like is next level chess. Yeah, um, I would agree. This could go any way. This is all about the winning pawn structure, right? This is this is what this is what comes to that pawn structure. I mean, white does have a passed pawn now, right? I mean, like that if we're going down yeah. that route. The but... IQP is eventually gonna <laughs> I told you that pawn was good. <laughs> there we go. This, this is still theory. 30 years later. All right, Queen Oh, so we see Queen C six. But without the trade on E three, of course. I mean the trade on right. E three is just basically a bad idea because um because F takes E three, opens the Queen's defense on the second rank and threatens that amazing knight so black right. never really wants to trade on e3 and that's why daniel put his rook on e3 to begin with to sort of fight that file allow maybe a knight to come to e6 open this diagonal yeah and i, I thought you might put bishop c4 here actually because now after queen c4 you have to i think you have to bring the knight back to d5 and the attack is kind of is slowed down for the moment There's definitely no bishop d5 here he could potentially play king h8 because he doesn't have a pawn on g7. So he's not going to get knight f7 to h6 checkmated. Uh, he could potentially play king h8. And he's thinking a moment. He's definitely not considering king f8, queen f7, or king g7, queen f7. Yeah, so he's those not two you playing can knight to d5 or queen d5. He's thinking about king h8 as well. And there we have queen d5. And... We could get an endgame. We could get an endgame. Since mate is threatened on g2 or h1, I think an endgame is very likely. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think the queen trade is good, but I mean, I'm looking at the final position and I'm just trying to figure out, like, is this black's really, is this really his best option? Because uh, it doesn't look good for black, does it? That's why you're wondering. I feel like white's playing for two results. I don't know if there's enough to win there, but it's definitely black who's now having to play defense to save this game and go to a tiebreak. Maybe it's based on this knight being trapped, right? Because we could go like queen d5, bishop d5. Mm-hmm. And now, at least they can't play knight a6 yet because of the rook on c1. So black still needs to figure something out. Uh, white still needs to figure something out with this rook on c1. And this threat of h6 hangs over white's head. So yes, white is up a pawn. But Maybe the white position has, is still uh, chaotic, even in this endgame. What about rook c1 here for white? And then just saying, if you take on e3, I play f takes e3. and Rook c to e1 now? Yeah. That's logical threatening to take on e8 to try and resolve things right and so if black moves off the file now white gets a free tempo to figure out how to you know kind of reconfigure the setup but also i think 96 there would be playable if he plays like rook d8 right. so i think black needs to continue playing forcing moves as well that rookie one move looks really strong to me um i'm really liking that yeah and you can't you know, there's no like fancy exchange sacrifice options here or anything. Like you can't play like rookie four and try to create a blockade or anything. So like you're, you're pretty you're pretty limited, right? Like you either yeah, move pretty limited. Off the file or you take on e three. But if you take on e three, now white gets you know two central pawns in the end game, which is obviously a good thing there All for right. white. And where is that knight going? Is it going to h five where it does nothing? Sure. Yeah. I mean, now white can play knight h three, knight f four at some point. And I think right. white the knight can get out if h six gets played. It can also go through e six now because the knight on f four had to move first. Exactly. Um, but you know, if knight a6, rook c2, maybe black still has enough to draw there, so white can't directly win yet. But in that position, can't white still play b4 and now just black is completely frozen? All right, the queen trade has been played, so yeah, so now rook e1 could come in, and then you're saying rook takes, pawn takes, knight h5, and then just play b4, improving that queen side, trying to lock that pawn on a6. Because now the bishop on d5, it has too many defensive tasks. It needs to stop these pawns from moving down the board. It also needs to stop white from eventually playing a4, b5. So if you play like right. bishop c4 here, that bishop is stretched. And so you can bring the knight back into the game through f3, then to e5, and it feels like it's almost game over. Yeah. And I was also going to say, depending on how fast we want to play this, a move for white coming up could also be king f2. Right. Just It allows you to answer rook c2 with rook e2. Mm -hmm. It allows you to move the knight from g5 to f3. So, yeah, rook c e1, rooks were traded on e3. 
And White took back with the Rook, not the Pawn. I wonder if there was anything wrong with taking back with the Pawn. Knight to G2, maybe. We didn't look at that. It's just tactical. Knight G2. Look at that Knight on F4 doing his own work. And so if Rook E2 here threatening to cash in the Rook for 200 pieces? Yeah, then you grab on H4. Ah, uh, okay. Your Knight came out. You've equalized material. You right, have two you... connected pass pawns on the king side to roll. If you play rook h2, just knight f3, so you don't even win the h7 pawn. So yeah. the line between winning and losing is so so thin this game, huh? Well, if white has to play rook takes e3, he then plays rook takes e3. He gets the e file, but he doesn't deal with the knight on f4 for the moment. And then black immediately plays a5, preventing that pawn on a6 from either being lost or just nailed down by b4 and then lost a little bit later. Right. I mean, this has definitely been the game where Kolaris has proved us wrong like every five moves, right? Like he just continues to show yeah. us that maybe some of our concerns aren't true. And, you know, the more yeah. I look at this, it feels a little bit more tenable for Black than, you know, my initial impression. There's still a back rank mate, basically. If this knight on c5 moved, yeah. Um, like if it took a pawn on a6, which isn't there anymore, but rook c1, king up, rook h1. Maybe, I mean, we'll see if I'm wrong, but I think knight h5 is going to be checkmate at the end of this. Yep. Yeah, that's a finish. Confirmed by the computer. So b3 is played instead. Rook to d8. I like this move a lot. Structure. <laughs> <laughs> and here we are. I mean, they get into a very tense endgame. White has an extra pawn still, but three isolated pawns. You would normally think the bishop's a bit better than a knight in this kind of endgame. So that's the weird thing about this, how it can flip-flop so fast, right? It's like... Right. White could win the game by having an extra pawn. But if White loses back that extra pawn to a move like knight g2, like we were looking at at times and was maybe just threatened just now by black, mm -hmm. um, White loses back that pawn. They could lose positionally once they've lost the pawn to the good black bishop. And yeah. I like this so, idea of knight h7, but doesn't knight h5 make it really difficult to get this knight back into the game? Well, then knight d7, I guess. I mean, he's definitely... We can say he's going on the attack here, right? He's trying to like yeah. make something of that E file that he's got. He's not feeling pumped about playing B4. He's not really able to use his D pawn or his B pawn yet. So he goes on the attack. If knight H5, let's see if knight D7 would be good or not. Black could just take on B3. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I mean, get the bishop off the square where it's hanging. There's well, no actual mate threat as long as you don't play king h8 in response to right. knight f6 open the rook hmm. a weird position i'll tell you that <laughs> let's see yeah. made another move knight h5 was played yeah all, all right. right so now we're here so now we are here it's interesting it's kind of like we're almost in a similar moment like we were last week where esteban pushed and pushed and pushed and there maybe was just not enough there. And then at the final moment, he makes a mistake in time trouble. And we're very close to nearing that similar moment here. So I'm going to be curious to see how, you know, Forcing Esteban makes an adjustment based on that game last week. So Bishop takes B3 is like a big question here. I mean, yeah. if you get a chance to pluck that, that queenside majority, you definitely want to. Um, I mean, what else could Kolaris be thinking about here other than Bishop B3? Because if you don't play Bishop B3, how are you going to be able to equalize? I just don't see it. I suppose one random thought would also be like king h8, just getting out of knight f6 ever being check. It just gives you more flexibility to deal with whatever comes up. Right, but this has to be awesome now for um, for black, right? I mean, this d4 pawn's really weak. If you trade off the minor pieces, only black can play for a win because white's pawn structure is so fractured, right? It's like rook d7, rook d7, knight d7. That's that's good news there for uh, for uh, for Kolaris. Rook d7, rook d7, knight d7. I mean. I would say that this knight versus bishop could go either way, except that the black king is so much better placed than the white king. So then I would say right. black's better after like knight c5, bishop c4, and um, the black king's just coming to d4 so quickly. Uh, I don't see... Well, I, but again, I mean, these can be tricky. There's knight b7, like... Yeah, I mean, with the time, anything can happen, of course. But I still think black is the slight, fav slight favorite here. And mm -hmm. you know, there's nothing for black to lose. He can always choose to offer the draw and go into the bullet tiebreak, or he can just try to play it out and see what happens. He does have a, sm a small time advantage, as you see rook d7 yep. on the board now. White did go for rook d7. They've got 30 seconds each. 
just the right amount of time. I mean, we got to say, like, not only do they play good moves, but look at the time usage from these GMs. I mean, they've negotiated all the tricky stuff very well, and they've still got just a bit of time left to figure it out. They're down to one-piece endings, which they basically know in general. They just have to work out a few details, a few tactics, but they know the general way to play this position. Um, it's right. really... Now I'm a little bit concerned Gross. here because Kolaris has to pick it up. He just he just spent a good you know five or six seconds on that move, and that that's yeah. an expensive six seconds when you got 20 seconds left. Yeah, he had some deep deep thoughts about that. Um, but okay, White's now, handling this correctly. I mean, he's putting all of the pawns on dark squares. Yeah, it doesn't look like White's necess like in much danger of losing now, right? With a couple of pawns traded and his king getting into the game. Yeah, I mean, all he has to do is just trade his, uh, the D, A, and Knight for this pawn on F5, move his king to A1, game, game's a draw. So, Forsen Esteban, I think, is you know playing it relatively safe here, which is a good call considering yeah. you know the position. So, can he just trade on F4 here? I think he could have if he really wanted to, but I think he's going to try to play this out a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And I think now we're going to get that... Uh, yeah, I think both players... Like, there are ways to force a draw, but they can also just play normal moves, and neither player can really win it, so. Yeah, and now we get the coveted bullet tiebreak, right? This is the first time we're going to see this bullet pairing between these two players. And so, Kolaris is white. We've seen him with white before in this knockout battle. And now, forcing Esteban, he now gets his second bullet tiebreak. He drew both of his games against a Wander. Two draws today would get the job done for Barcelona. But yeah. he's got to go through Kolaris, who's proven to be quite a force in these knockout battles. So now yeah, that we've that gotten was to a the good game. If you yeah. wanted to learn something about, quote, winning pawn structures or the IQP, there was a lot to learn from that. It was so dynamic. Both players really using their strengths, their advantages in that game. I mean, I would argue, though, that this is definitely not a winning pawn structure based on the result of this game, right? I mean, that's since the board fails. <laughs> the one result that gets neither, neither result accomplished. But if both sides understand the winning <laughs> pawn structure, it becomes a draw. <laughs> but then that's not winning anymore. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough fair enough but i mean isaac like i'm left with the impression that if had i been white in this game i would have lost and had i been black in this game i also would have lost i just oh, saw for so, sure so much dynamism so many opportunities for both sides that like you miss one step and like the gm just wraps you up with either color yeah i mean both both gms i mean i've just been really impressive today and that puts us at the one one bullet tiebreaker We've yeah. seen this go a lot of different ways. We've seen GMs who don't play bullet play, like when Akobian played Shankland a couple of weeks ago. We've yeah. seen GMs who do play bullet play in this tiebreaker, like a Wander last week after the you know the fresh JSCZ start. What yeah. do you think we'll see between uh, Forsen Esteban and Dimitri Colors in this pairing? I would guess that these are both GMs who have played bullet. Um, so we may see a slightly higher level of uh, of bullet play. I mean, bullet goes by pretty fast. It's hard to see the level of the players as they play it. But um, I think we might see might see both of them be pretty good at bullet. I mean, if I wanted to know better than that, I would have to uh, look them up on chess.com with their main accounts, you know? Uh, of course. So without knowing that information, before you start looking at bullet ratings and everything, <laughs> based, okay. on, based on how they've been playing so far today in a one-off bullet game, are you still oh, sticking man. with Forsen Esteban? They've both been so good today that um that i could see going with either player and it would be one of those things where i'm like well basically a toss-up uh but i always pick somebody and i mean you have to right i mean you pressured me a couple of weeks ago yeah. to pick someone so now yeah. you're on the hot seat right oh, no i i, I <laughs> always do i always do don't worry and i'm gonna still go with force and esteban um uh, basically i mean i i can't really see an advantage between the players so i'm gonna go with the draw odds um we've seen we've already seen in at least one one minute game. I think it was a wonder was playing it. No, or was it Force and Esteban? He had like this big advantage, and instead of winning the game, he just traded into opposite colored bishops and it's just like boom, draw. And so I'm smart. Like, I, don't, yeah. I don't have to find the win. I don't have like these moves might all be like very bizarre looking from like a chess perspective, right? Like you're expecting, like, oh, he's gonna attack on the king side. Now he's got like white like bottled up on the first rank. And then he just trades off all the pieces of the player who's cramped. You're like, why? And then it's just a dead draw. So we have seen how a player of this level can use the draw odds. Um, and how the fact that you know only like 5% of bullet games are draws does not speak to the advantage of that draw odds. The ability for a player who knows they have it to just move the game to those draw odds. 
the one second increment means you're not going to get flagged by going into because that's how a lot of those bullet games end in one player winning or losing is if they create that drawn game um that then somebody basically flags before they can play 50 moves in an opposite colored bishop endgame for um, sure with that one second increment it's basically you've locked in the win once you create that drawn endgame yeah um so we've seen how it can be used. I would have to go with with Force and Esteban. Yeah, and the stats would agree with you there. I mean, if you look at the results of every single bullet tiebreaker we've had so far, Daniel Narodzicki beat Zhang Di with black. Akobian beat Sam Shankland with black. Force and Esteban, as you mentioned, drew a, co uh, drew a Wander Liang from a winning position with black. And the only time we've seen white win was when a Wander beat Bragi Thorfinnsson in the third place game last week. So here we go with E4, E5. Are we going to see a Berlin end game, do you think? Uh, too late for that, but... Um, I, 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 I don't know. I think, uh, Force and Esteban plays mainline Rui Lopez is as black. Um, but this goes so fast. It's hard to keep track of that. All right. Quick H6 G5. We saw this in, uh, in, uh, in Croatia, just like two days ago. I must have um, missed that game. He actually played this in the first round. Oh, right, right, right. One okay. with black with this quick G pawn rush. Yeah, when I see this G pawn rush, I'm thinking of the Kromnik Aronian game from candidates where just Kromnik just blew Aronian off of the board with you know his G pawn push. And I think it's a practical decision here to just kind of throw a wrench into White's like plan. So White has to start thinking now and Black can you know use that time to his advantage. Yeah, it's a good opening choice. Uh, for anyone seeing the 1400 and 1800 ratings in parentheses, this is just, I mean, these are official accounts that don't really play much bullet. We don't, we don't have in front of us force and esteban or colars is real bullet ratings um so far colars a little bit faster yeah i'm starting to like colars's position more and more because this g pawn just never materialized into anything and this knight on c5 is going to be really yeah. annoying especially in a bullet time control to deal with knight takes b7 ideas maybe yeah. at some point this knight goes back uh and can be a little bit frustrating i think black's position is looking a little bit like a random collection of weaknesses Ooh, queen a4 yeah that's that's no good because now bishop b5 is going to follow through unless you play king f8. Yeah, he's um, going to have to move his king. To play. He's going to have to move his king. Now the plan is to attack the c7 pawn. That's that's clever. And also just seeing the extra speed from uh, from Kolars. I mean, 40 seconds against 15 is like huge in this kind of a format. Yeah, and I mean, we've never really seen Force and Esteban struggle, um, you know, yeah. with, in these bullet time controls of like, if anything, against a wander, he had a 20 second advantage, in fact. So... He I mean, was happy. He was happy to double the C pawns just to get out of that like pressure. But this is a tough position. He does have those opposite colored bishops though, so yeah, an important move there. By the way, accurate converting this right. <laughs> and a three was really important because if you don't play a three, all of a sudden there's rook b four, rook g four, and wait, now white's under attack. So yeah, very good all kinds of stuff. Shot there. Oh, it came from the other side with rook g four, but Kolars broke through the C pawn. He still got twenty five seconds to keep it together yeah and that bishop on h6 isn't doing you any favors at all just don't play rook c1 if you're white and you're okay uh oh he wants a5 rook a5 is the only way to stop it good that's important oh looks a little bit desperate for for force and esteban he's sped up but it still looks a little desperate one two three four five one two three four he's only down a pawn yeah the opposite that's... colored bishops are the only thing that's going for force and esteban but he's gonna have to earn still this okay. draw oh man this is tense yeah, and now if rook d1, that was bishop d6. So black is going to slowly regroup, bring this king over to e7, maybe play for rook g8, and try to get yeah. some sort of kingside attack to so slow white down, get a time advantage, and try to make the most of that. Can he trade and grab the h3 pawn? He does not. Okay. Okay, but now he's going to play for rook a8. That rook on b7 is basically awkward. That's what he's saying. Whoa. Rook Whoa, B8, what's going to happen? B7, B7, right? Got to go to B3 with the rook. Oh, no, he opens up the C5. bishop. Okay, well, anything can happen. That B pawn can be used to win now that it can't be challenged. Um, it's right. It's hard to defend against. And Kolaris can't repeat the move here. If, if he's going to play rook G7, he's he, got he to get his rook the off the G pawn now. Here comes the C pawn. Nice move. Nice move. Oh, no. He can't take on oh. B7. What a trap. What a trap. And now it looks like Kolaris has the win, I think. Because he was able to eliminate that C pawn at no cost, I think he's got it. Yeah, I mean now it now it looks like a real problem because you're not able to maneuver around, and you know all all White has to do is distract the. Uh, wait, hold on a second here. Okay, Maybe he's got something really nice. Yeah. Oh, that was got a smart him. deflection. Got him, Cole Lars. <laughs> he's the, the next Akobian. <laughs> the new Akobian. 
So that means Baden Baden gets a life insurance policy for this life club match. It's okay if they lose now because with six points, they're right in the middle of it. Barcelona's going to have seven. Baden Baden's going to have six. Reykjavik's going to have six. But Pittsburgh is now in a must win situation. If they lose this life club match, they're going to have to play for third next week with only two points on the board. Yeah, Pittsburgh's the team that's that's under pressure. I mean, Kolar's basically, if Baden Baden loses, then they'll be the opposite of the Puffins, right? The Puffins will be the team that has lost the knockouts fourth place twice but won yep. both their club matches. So they'll be carried by their fans, right? While their pro representative is not is not at the level of, you know, Kolars and Force and Esteban, the other jams being sent here to the knockout arena. But Baden Baden will be the team where Kolars is trying to like carry all these fans all by himself. Yeah, I mean, Kolar is like Baden Baden should be really thanking him for, you know, turning out the performances. We'll see how Baden Baden has improved over the course of the week, but you know, Pittsburgh's yeah. also in a must-win situation, so they're going to be bringing their best fans as well. So that's going to be starting at about 10.30 a.m. Pacific time. Um, it is 10.30 a.m. Pacific time. That's starting so, in nine minutes. Yeah, so the match the match just opened, which means that if you want to register, you still can. I'm seeing title players on both sides of the board. Yeah. Um, should, be a, should be really tough, although bottom, bottom, bring the numbers. Again, again, where are the Pittsburgh fans, man? You said yeah, they I mean, did everything right. They did everything right during the week, but they've got people to show up. I mean, they've got Artak Manuki and they've got Helms Knight showing up right now. But, you know, if they don't have players show up in the next 10 minutes, their summer series, you know, hopes could be on the lines going into this. But it looks like we're going to take a quick break um, going uh, right before. But if you want to join the live club match, check out, check out the landing page links for the clubs and join your favorite teams in this summer series matchup, which would ultimately determine who is moving through to the summer series championships. All right, welcome back, everybody. We are happy now to be joined by General Manager Grant Shu of the uh, Pittsburgh Pond Grappers. 
Hey, Grant. Uh, how are you feeling after watching that that knockout? Uh, your player played some intense games there, Shabalov, some very wild tactical games. How is that to watch? I mean, Shaba was just being Shaba, and I really can't complain about the way he's playing. Um, mm -hmm. I think he's playing some great chess. Uh, I think Kolars was under some really intense pressure in the first game, and Shaba couldn't really bring it home. Um, but that's that's the case when you play positions like that all the time. It could go either way. Exactly. I mean, you, if you play a position like that, you have to expect that sometimes you're going to make a mistake, sometimes your opponent will. But um, for me, watching it, it's super like intense to the point of almost nerve wracking. How about for you as like a manager? How is it to how is it to be watching? Like, are you enjoying it because it's a great game, or are you worried that? I mean, about getting the yeah, win. I, th I think I was. Uh... Definitely a little stressed out too, because okay. um, this week, uh, both in the live club match and in the knockout battle, we kind of needed to get some results on the board. And um, I think it was really important that Shaba at least advanced to the final. He wasn't able to do it, but uh, I was really rooting for him. And uh, not, not only did the position look great, like I have access to computer evaluations and I mean, it was, uh, I think it was plus three, plus four at some point. So, um, but again, I can't follow him for not pulling through. So when you, when you watch games, do you often have the evaluation going to know what's going on? Or is that, is that, do you normally have that just as a default? Uh, normally I don't, but uh, in the case when it's a really tense tactical position, I, yeah. I like to turn it on to see what's going on. The game okay. because I can't figure it out on the fly. Um, right. Yeah. Cool. So if if things are like crazy enough, you'll turn it on to to be sure of what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, I've got another question for you. I mean, you used to play for Pittsburgh. Then this past season, you played for the Marshals, and now you've gone from being a player to a general manager. Um, how do you feel about uh, switching teams, and how do you feel about switching between being a player and being a manager? I mean, I think it's definitely a unique challenge. Um, I uh, enjoyed playing for Pittsburgh when uh, Pittsburgh first entered the league the first two years. Um, I think it's a, a great group of players. And last year, uh, the roster construction was just so that I couldn't really contribute. So I played for New York. Um, and I'm glad to be back. Um, it's great to be able to both play and make decisions about who's playing. Um, mm -hmm. I love doing both at the same time. Yeah, I have a question about making those decisions. I mean, you're going to play for Pittsburgh as well as managing, right? Uh, I believe so, yes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, at the end of their season, the uh, the Marshals chose not to put you in in their first playoff uh, game. Had you been the general manager of the Marshals, would you have put yourself in for that playoff match against the Windmills? Uh, I mean... That's that's a really hard question to answer. Uh, yeah. You can ask Alex for uh, his rationale for uh, why he decided to go with the lineup he did. Um, I think even with the lineup we had in, we had our chances to win that match. And it's not about one player. It's more about the construction of all four players as a whole. So mm -hmm. I can't say that I would have definitely put me in or dependent on what other players were also in the lineup. Okay, but with the with the boards one, two, and three that that were in the roster, right? I mean, it's my job to ask you the hard questions. You you can you can refuse to answer if you want, but <laughs> with the with the first three boards that you had, you could have played board four interchangeably, right? So would you have put yourself in the match? Um, if I was a general manager, um, I my I would have been a little hesitant because the. Last week that I played, I think it was against Montreal, I went uh, over four, absolutely abysmal. Um, mm -hmm. So from a perspective of a manager, you have to look at a performance and like have some um, concerns. From a yeah. player perspective, I know that like I, I was still confident in how I was able to play, but um, definitely from a manager perspective, you can't just ignore O for four performance. So if you were Grant's manager and you weren't Grant, you would say, in his most recent match, he played badly. 
I've got another good option. Maybe I'll do that. If you were Grant, the manager and player, you would know that you were still confident and that it was an aberration for one week. Exactly. Yes. Okay. So we could expect you this next season, maybe to put yourself in often because you feel confident. Uh, we'll see about that. <laughs> <laughs> There's another player manager who has um, a similar role as you, I think, Artak Manukian. Right. Um, he's both a very strong board four, right? Who overperforms his rating by, you know, 200 to 300 points, very similar to you. Um, and he's the manager for his team. And he has a good alternative on board four, right? In Ana Sartsian. So he repeatedly had to make the choice between, and it was interchangeable for his first three boards. He had to choose between playing her or playing himself. And I think it's, uh, it's a very tough decision to make probably between, you know, wanting to like seem wanting to seem like you're fair to other players and not just putting yourself in, but also, I mean, you play that well, you have to have some, some confidence. Um, so I don't know. That's he's, he's playing for your team today, right? Yes, I see that. And we're excited about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, when I expect that when I'll be making a lot of decisions, uh, it'll be more of like, a I'll be putting players in based to put them in a position to succeed. Um, and I know that I play better against certain types of players and uh, certain steps of play. Uh, so I'll definitely take that into account. Um, I definitely don't want to seem like I'm kind of calling my own number all the time. I want to get as many players involved as possible and I want to put them in the best position to succeed. Great. All right. Well, thank you, Grant. We'll let you um, get back to nervously watching these uh these games here for the pawn grabbers we're expecting a very tense match here that's just uh that's just kicking off here the first couple moves on the board so um i hope you can enjoy some good chess and uh hopefully we will too thank you looking forward to the games thanks grant all right, all right David, isaac we'll anything surprising in grant's interview I mean, I thought you definitely did a, you know, you gave the hardest interview you have so far this summer series. So definitely, definitely some tough questions for him up front. So, um, you know, I was, I was a little bit curious to see like what, what his thoughts were on the overall fan turnout for Pittsburgh. I mean, we, we called it earlier in the match and, you know, we noticed that bottom, bottom, again, more fans in Pittsburgh at the beginning of the match, it seems to have leveled out on those top boards. In fact, Pittsburgh has small advantages where it counts, but they're going to need to win on those boards. Their bottom boards are going to need a little bit of help. I think that a half point here, a half point there are going to make the difference. So I was curious to see how maybe Grant would have handled, you know, trying to bring in more fans, trying to make sure that they turn out, turn out to these matches. Uh, because, I mean, this is this is foreseeably an elimination game unless something, some, you know, some miracle happens next week and uh, they manage yeah. to finish third place and win the Twitter vote. Yeah, I felt like we'd already given a wonder a tough time about that last week, like where are the Pittsburgh fans and uh, I mean, you said I gave a tough interview, but I also, I didn't want to just harp on the same thing, right? Like you said they did what they could. So I, I chose to talk about something else with him, um, sort of a unique thing to talk with a manager, I thought. So yeah, and I think that, that kind of perspective. Yeah, and I think that kind of uh, insight is going to become very valuable for some of these player managers who are entering the pro trust league qualifiers and competing for the first time. And a lot of these times, these managers are also grandmasters. Uh, for example, I can already think of Marseille Migraines having Maxime Bashir Lagrave as their manager and their, you know, de facto board one. So, uh, you know, this is going to become something that I think is more common. I think it's actually better for teams to have player managers because they understand what it's like to be there on the front lines. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's always it's always a tough question. Do you do you play yourself or do you not? I actually yeah. had a similar case where you know when we were playing against the London Lions, our initial lineup that we were going to play had me playing on board four. And that was a really tough decision because like, I'm sitting there like, I've never done this before. Like, am I really cut out to be on a pro chess league lineup? And ultimately we wound up going another way because I thought, you know what, this is best for the team. But that, that's always like a really difficult position because on one hand you want to play in the league. On the other hand, you want what's best for the team. And it's good to hear that yeah. Grant is thinking about what is it going to be, you know, to make the team get to that next level. And the goal for Pittsburgh right now is, qualify for the Pro Chess League, do well in the summer series, and ultimately do really well during the Pro Chess League regular season as well. Yeah. My team, San Francisco, struggled a little on uh, the bottom boards this season. And I can tell you there were three different times this year where I considered like swapping myself into like the roster and becoming a player manager, but it has not happened yet. Um, 
All right. So for anyone who's just arriving, doesn't know what's going on, the Pittsburgh Pawn Grabbers account here is Grandmaster Alexander Shabalov, a member of their Pro Chess League team who's playing as the representative of the team in what is a fan club match. So he's followed by, you know, 15 other fans of, of uh, Pittsburgh, 15 or 20 fans of Pittsburgh. He's got board one for them. He's playing against Dimitri Kolars. That's the bottom, bottom snowballs account. Kolars, who is fresh off of a bunch of really successful defensive play and uh, the winner of, oh, no, sorry, second place in this week's knockout. No, first place in the first right. place. He yeah, won. He, he, so, won, he won the bullet so He's won two knockouts. So um, uh, a tough matchup. We expect a close match. So we expect that the games between Shaba and Kolars could be decisive um, for the whole match. And uh, since we both think that Baden Baden has a slightly favorable lineup of fans at the moment, uh, that would say that there's some pressure from uh, on uh, on Shaba to to deliver some points here. Yeah, and there's also some pressure on Artak too. If he's trying to go from the gamesmanship route, perhaps he thinks that you know, in the case where Pittsburgh plays Armenia in the playoffs, that would be better than you know Armenia playing Baden 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 Baden, of course, being a finalist. Armenia there too, and oh, so yeah, maybe he's thinking history. if if the Armenia Eagles play Pittsburgh in the playoffs, it's it's better than Baden Baden. So I want to play for Pittsburgh to help them get points and eliminate Baden Baden now while we still can. So mm -hmm. it's a very interesting gamesmanship approach from the Armenian manager. So a lot at stake for a lot of different teams that are actually not even playing today and haven't even played in the summer series yet. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you, you mentioned Artok. Now that he's made a move in this game here against Blizzard 3388, Artok is officially the first person to have played for three different Pro Chess League teams. Well, including summer series, right? I think Cameron Wheeler right. actually holds that record because I believe he's played for San Francisco, Dallas Destiny, yeah. and there's one other team I'm forgetting. Oh, um, I didn't but know he's he played, played for, for another team. He's played for one team, one different team every season. He was the first player to do that in Pro Chess League history. Tuck oh, team might be the second. A different third team? Yeah, I mean, I, rem I remember that because he he disclosed that when we were doing uh, interviewing for one of our recaps for the cool. Pro Chess League season. But well, that's, okay, so that's a nice record for Cameron, actually. Yeah, so Cameron holds the record, but Artok is a close second. But he can he can brag that he's done it within like the same season, right? Playing for within you know, potentially three different teams, three different teams within one season, which during the Pro Chess League is just not allowed by rules. It's just not even possible. Yeah, the live club matches make it so that that becomes possible. So yeah, hard to challenge that role. What do you think of his position here? I mean, this is a this is a very much like Artok style position. He loves space, and I've played it before in various events like Arena Kings. I've watched him play in the Pro Chess League as a successful board for. And when he has space, the positional evaluation to him doesn't really matter. He always, you know, is able to move quickly and figure things out. Now, one thing I will be interested in is he did play for San Francisco against, I believe, the St. Louis Archbishops or the Chengdu Pandas. Can't remember which team specifically, uh, which matchup specifically. I think he went half out of two. Um, yeah, so it's going to be true. interesting to see how he recuperates. And maybe he's also seeing this as a training opportunity for if Armenia needs him to play as a team representative and down the road at Group C. Yeah, I mean, it's very possible that he will be playing in uh, Group C. So I'm sure like every extra game that he gets in here can only be helpful for Armenia. I think um, given that Black has this this lack of space out of what looks like some kind of an old Indian or something, um, uh, it, feels, it feels like Black's actually got reasonably comfortable position with some trades in and the A5 pawn to tickle. And uh, I, think, I think Black's doing okay so far. So still a lot of work for our talk. Yeah, for sure. I mean, this is the kind of position that he loves because there's not a lot of dynamic things happening in the position. So he's able to kind of adjust and, you know, make decisions pretty, you know, you know, on his own, you know, on, at his own pace. But I mean, he's got to be careful. I mean, this D5 pawn, as you're pointing out here, could be a potential liability. Yeah. All right. So Bishop C4 looks like it's coming. I mean, he's been reluctant to play this move B4 for a while. Um, which seemed like maybe needed to defend the A5 pawn, free up his rook to come to C3. But it looks like it might be one step too late and that this bishop could come to C4 immediately here with some some bad effect. Um, well, let's, yeah. let's maybe get back to Shaba, um, who's used a completely different approach to this game, <laughs> right? Like the super positional approach instead of the wild tactics. Um I mean, you know very well that Shaba can play with both styles. It doesn't mean he's not being true to himself when he plays positionally. He can do this too. Yeah, I mean, one thing that, you know, 
has always stuck out to me in terms of his ability to play positionally is I think when players prepare for him in the pro chess league, they're expecting these tactical dog fights. They're expecting, you know, openings that don't have a lot of developed theory. And so they spend their time preparing that and Shaba comes in with a different approach. I mean, one of the reasons why Pittsburgh beat St. Louis two years ago in the regular season was because Shabalov had prepared the Catalan for Fedoseev and just outplayed him from move one. He did the same thing against Basim Amin from Montclair two years ago as well. So he's proven time and time again that he's a very dangerous positional player, even though everyone thinks of, a, thinks of him as a tactical player. Two twenty seven hundreds. Well, I don't know who drew first blood, but the score just went from 1-1 to 2-1 in favor of Pittsburgh. So, Right, and I, I believe that's the first time Pittsburgh's taken a lead, lead in any live club match so far this summer series. So definitely a good start for them. I know Bottom Bottom took that first point, but within 15 seconds, Pittsburgh had tied it up 1-1. One one. Yeah. Oh, you know, Helms Knight, um, our squad streamer, is up against a FIDE master now. She went 0-2 this morning. Yeah, um, she's got a tough pairing here. I mean, she's, and now she's got a really around. tough pairing. So, I mean, very instructive games for her stream, I guess. But looking at her position. I mean, I'm counting two pieces. What about you? Yeah, I mean, E3 might be hanging. So she might only be down one piece. But it certainly it looks a bit tough. I mean, I wonder if Black even has Knight before there to get out of things in a weird way. Yeah, I mean, it would be slightly different if this bishop on c4 were on c2, and then maybe White could talk about potential counterplay. But the pieces are just not organized in a way that that makes sense. Yeah. So it's basically just going to be one extra piece for feeding master Mbinioi, or That sounds correct. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's kind of tough for her at first here, huh? Um, right. And then another player who we wanted to mention who's put in a lot of uh, games in this uh, uh, summer series is Art Vega. Um, he's played nonstop blitz for the last hour and a half during the knockout. And uh, here he is with uh, with the white pieces against middle gamer Umesh. And uh, looks like he's got uh, looks like he's got a lot of pressure on this pawn on C5, huh? So maybe just in the process of collecting an extra pawn. Yeah, I mean, this is, you know, not the ideal setup for black, especially if you have a queenside fiend kind of where this bishop is kind of staring at the butt of the d5 pawn and it's a weakness. So, like, that's one thing that I'm a little bit worried about. I like that white's put this bishop on f5. So if you can figure out, like, c6, as you're pointing out here, if there's a way to maybe redirect the knight to d d4 and then play against knight qp, I think this would be a good case of a bad iqp. This would not be the same as Kolar's playing against forcing Esteban in that first game. Yeah, wow. I mean, he's having a real think here. So I think he must have spotted c6. If he just played the normal move, knight b to d4, Pawn takes c5, queen takes c5. He's up a pawn. He's got the pawn blockaded on d5. It's like everything you want. So if you're looking more, it's because you're getting a little bit greedy. You're sensing there may be this opportunity with c6. When I say greedy, I don't mean it in a bad way because I think c6 is like a killer here. Right. Um, and one thing to point out about just the importance of this individual pairing is that look at the rating differential between Art Vega playing for Pittsburgh and middle gamer Umesh playing for Baden Baden. This is one of the oh, biggest yeah. rating differential differentials by board in this pairing, which means that if Art yeah. Vega wins both, that's good news for Pittsburgh. If middle gamer Umesh can steal a draw, that's great news for Baden Baden. That's a point yeah. that they probably should not have had. So C6, we're seeing the move here. And if Art Vega right. can convert, I mean, that's great news for the Pittsburgh pawn grabbers. Yeah. I mean, it's one of the few boards where Pittsburgh has a huge rating advantage. So they um, they definitely need the points here. I think Art Vega is delivering this first game. I mean, if he's paying that much attention, nailed the C6 moment here, I think uh, he's looking good in this first game. So we'll get back to the GMs. Here, Queen C6 hits the rook, right? So it wins a piece. Yeah. And um, the knight can't be recaptured. That was part of the point here. And uh, I think we're going to see a resignation pretty soon. Or Yeah. You know, the rook is in a trap reason. too. So Queen takes eight. It. That's it. Very nice. Too bad that done. G3 pawn isn't on H2 to allow bishop takes. Yep, we were there for it. Um, back to the GMs. And, uh, you know, white has made this knight trade on E6. It left black with a seemingly strong center as long as there were a lot of pieces around as well. But long term, Kolars has to be very careful about his light squares. And, uh, you know, we see this bishop can eventually hang out on H3 and really pester him. Now, I think uh, I think if Shaba could get his knight involved, he would have a nice advantage. 
Yeah, I mean, this is not the kind of position that you want to have with Black and these rapid time controls. And notice one key difference between this game and that first game where Shabalov had the advantage with Black. Look at the clocks. They're about 20 seconds within each other. No mm -hmm. advantage for Dmitry Kalers there. And that was the difference in that first game. Yeah. So Shabalov figuring out how to play the game, how to adjust to a 10 plus 2 time control, which he's experienced with because he's played in it with the Battle Royale. And he's got a good position here. Um, and I just, I like this move, bishop c5 a lot. Knight takes c5, you don't really want to play this because b takes c5, and that's a pass pawn forever. Uh, and right. then good luck stopping that after a move like d4 from white here. The funny thing is, if this were doubles chess, like here I would have played knight c3, where he played bishop c5. I wasn't really looking at bishop c5, right? So I would have played knight c3, but just looking at the move score, I see that like, you know, Shaba just moved his knight back from c3 to d1, you know? So mm -hmm. it's like that funny situation where like you move a piece, and then your partner moves it back, and then you move a piece. Well, I don't know what that's called, tandem or something, where you like alternate moves. Yeah, I think it's um, it's either tandem. It's not hand and brain, because hand and brain right. is always the same person making the moves. So I think right. it's just tandem. Maybe it's called tandem, but it's like you move a piece somewhere, and your opponent's like, no, your partner, your partner slash opponent's like, no, no, I want it here. No, I want it there. No, I want it here. I'm I mean, not sure what the knight's doing on D1, so hopefully Shaba's going to tell me at some point here. I mean, maybe an idea is to play knight to E3 at some point, although I'm not exactly sure why the knight belongs there if you know the light right. scores aren't that weak. It would be different if the bishop were on B3 and then the queen were on H3. Then we could have a different discussion, but... You know, that, that takes a lot of manpower to switch those two pieces. Right. All right, so rook e8 is played, not opening up the b file. I mean, opening up the b file would have been very committal because the b5 pawn would have been basically dead, you know. So there would have had to be a very tactical follow-up from black. So rook e8 instead, the knight comes to e3, like you say. We get a pawn trade on d3. I think that pawn trade now, helped white, though, right? I mean, like breaking the tension that early, that's got to be good news for white because you could put the rook on e1, and now e6 is a real target. Black could move it to e5 at some point so the pawn itself isn't dying, but then the light squares on yeah. d5 and d7 come into focus, right? And just losing control of those squares could be just as bad as losing the pawn. And we um, get our favorite move if Black plays e5, this idea of knight f5, kind of the reverse of what Kalaars did to uh, force an Esteban in the last game. So a lot of you know dynamic potential here for white. So you you never really want to move these pawns forward unless you have a concrete solution on how to swap all of these positional resources for white. Yeah. All right. That'll stop rookie one for a moment because of the fork of Reno. Yep. Um, what's he got in mind? Is he going to play H5, Knight G4? I mean, he's got to deal with this annoying jerk on H3. He dealt with him. He scared him so much with F3, he brought him back to G2. That is fantastic for Kolars. Yeah, I mean, that's that's good news for Kolars in the sense that he's bringing this game uh, a little bit closer to balance, but there's still some work to do. I mean, the downside now is with this Bishop on G2, the king is safer, and you still can't play E5 as easily because now D5 is weak. So there's still yeah. a lot of work to do. He's still facing a bishop pair with a weak e6 pawn. So yeah, there's <laughs> there's still some work to do, and he's got 140 against 340. That's a major lack of time resources to do all that work. Definitely. And I like how Shabbos is starting to play smarter now within this time control. And he's figuring out exactly where he wants to make his decisions. I love that, you know, we identified he made this decision to play positionally after that first game with Kalaris. And it's, you know, it's paying off a lot. I like this move Rook A1 as well. Maybe Rook C1 now, you know, just yeah. continuing to bring pressure on the C file. What I would advise to Shaba here, and he did it. There we go is avoid trades, actually. I mean, within reason, don't play stupid moves, right? I mean, you, you, when you give this kind of advice, you always want to play like approximately the best moves. But when you've got a choice between equal moves, prolong things. Yeah. Because you want, you want Kolars to be down to 10 seconds before you go to the end game, right? Right. So try and find some simple moves to keep things going, you know, Rook F to D1 or whatever. And just like Kolars think a little bit more before you trade stuff off. Because Kolars is in an almost critical time situation here where it's going to be very hard for him to trade off five more pieces in one and a half minutes without making a major mistake. And that's what he needs to do. He needs to get to, you know, clarify the game in a way that's at least not bad for him. Maybe favorable, but at least not bad. With just yeah. And look at that, taking down. I like this move, rookie one as well. You know, my my initial concern after bishop d4 was when Kalaris played rook, rook c8. How is white going to put that rook on c1? And I completely missed the point. Rookie one is now threatening knight takes d5, and now Kalaris has this whole new tactical consideration to keep in mind. Let's say what black plays like knight on e, e5 to d7. Well, now that e6 pawn is weak, white can still move that knight away from e3 
And now that whole point of moving that knight from C3 to D1 to E3, it's working within the flow of the game. And that's an important step up for Shabalov. Yeah, I mean, maybe he will do this. There's nowhere good to move the knight right now. And Kolars wants to play queen C2. But isn't there like bishop H3 again? I played knight G6. Yeah, but then you come back to E5. And what does white do, right? Do they allow knight oh, F3 okay, check? Because you've got point. the bishop on D4 as well as the rook. Um, all right, so he did move the knight off of E5. And now if bishop H3, I think, again, knight E5 could happen. But look, he went down to 40 seconds. I mean, that was a 30-second think when, you know, he's only got one of those left in him this game. <laughs> Yeah, maybe the thing to do here is just play bishop h3 anyways, allow 95, and then just quickly repeat once. So that way you burn more time because I'm sure Kolars is trying to figure out every single possible way to get out of this, you know, stranglehold from white. Yeah. And it's worth noting that bottom bottom is actually just taking the lead. Pittsburgh was up five to he's one. He's going for knight d5. He's D7. going for something decisive. Knight d7, bishop d5, and it's... Ooh. Better be right about this. Otherwise, he did it 30 seconds too soon. Should have waited till Kolars had 10 seconds to go for okay. something. Okay. Like well, let's 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 plan this out, right? Let's say Black plays Queen D7. You know, yeah. just kind of playing it safe. You don't have to take that Rook immediately. It looks like it looks like you have. A little you could bit. play Rook E6 or Bishop E6. Yeah. Yeah. And Bishop E6 upgrade. here looks pretty strong. You think Bishop E6 looks good? Bishop E6 looks really strong. Trade on C8. And then when the queen takes back on c8, maybe play queen d5, hitting rook a8 and the bishop on f8. Yeah. The rook on f7 is still tied up. That's a lot to deal with. And I think Shaba's just double checking now. The question is can Shaba look like, you know, four or five moves ahead and either find a win or find something tough enough that uh, Kolars won't have seen it coming and won't have the time to deal with it? Yeah, for sure. And I, I like that he's spending time here. This is the moment where you want to calculate. Ideally, it's a move before, but. Maybe he had already seen this in his calculation. He's double-checking his homework. Bishop e6 there. Queen b7. I think you can just play bishop c8. And as you said, queen d5. I love this move for white. But he's got to follow up fast on this. I mean, if he played bishop e6, he had to have, like, his follow-ups. you got to play them fast then, right? Like, you've looked two moves ahead. We, we believe you have. Right. And now notice that if black puts anything on e7, the rooks work together. You can just take those minor pieces and it's game right. over. Queen I mean, f8 is forced, but Kolar's double-checked for, like, 20 seconds. So he was not confident about what's happening there. But what is happening here? Yeah, actually, queen d5 feels like that's one move too late, right? King g7 and... Yeah. King what is g7, the bishop's defended. Oh, then he's got rook f7, queen f7, queen d6. Oh, wow. But now rook a8, bishop e1. So what does he do next? Rook to b1 here, probably. Yeah, Hits the bishop b1. and still has the idea of rook f7, queen f7, and taking on b4. So it's probably rook b1 here. And Shaba had that time to figure it out and double check it. You know, you right. can't predict every single move. Yeah, and that was an now important, looks an important moment. Rook A8. Rook A8? Yeah, I think Rook A8 is just Rook oh. F7. What? What was that? Is there what? What? There was nothing else to calculate after Rook A8, was there? I didn't see anything. Did he miss Rook A8? Maybe that's why he didn't play Queen D5 to begin with. He just didn't see that this was at the corner of the board. Yeah, I mean, there's there's nothing we're missing here, right? I mean, chess. No, I, mean, I mean, they're GMs, but it's only so complicated. I mean, chess is it's, chess. It's, I think it's a time trouble speaking volumes here. And this is an important point for Pittsburgh, by the way, because they're trailing by about one to two points. Now it's 11 and a half, nine and a half. So a win here will kind of give the fans a little bit more momentum. So Shabalov yeah. has to convert. A draw here is probably not going to be enough. Rook B7 is not possible because of the knight. No. So you have to find a way to get this rook into the game. Maybe rook E1. Rook E1. But this is basically just anyone's game now. I mean, I think white yeah. still is favored. There aren't a ton of scenarios where black wins between the open king and the extra pawns for white. Like if you trade off queens, white can still draw the end game. If you don't trade off queens, I mean, it's hard to attack white without your own king getting attacked. But overall, still, it's like, it's like he has to play the game all over again in a sense. D5. Very and hard to win for white. The way to lose for white would be to spend 40 seconds trying to win and get down to 5 to 10 seconds to play the whole game. Right, but what? now are we getting to a point where queen takes d5 and it just feels like Kolaris is escaping this. He could have gone to d7. He thought for 20 seconds to hang the d-pawn. I don't see the follow-up. And I was surprised by this d-pawn push like to begin with. I thought white was going to play a move like rook to e6 and then push the d-pawn. So now the light squares aren't you know as easy to defend for black. Now this kind of just feels like Maybe black is the one who's playing for two results unless yeah. you know, unless I'm missing something. Yeah, I mean, it should still be drawable, but I mean, hanging that deep on for nothing, missing a clear win, and using up the time advantage, it's not, it doesn't feel good for him. And Kolar's 
is a player who's been through a lot of these scenarios. So like, All right, so he sees queen h8 there. That was important. And I'm not seeing a lot more, maybe you know, not even queen e5 does anything here. Okay. But now knight c7 is threatened and you're pinned. You don't want to trade queens. I'm learning something here from Kolars. He could have brought the knight to e4, try to get active, try and turn things around with an attack, but he knew it wasn't yet time. He still needs to defend. His position's not so good. Um, oh my goodness. Rook b8 is dangerous. Yeah, Dang. actually this is... I mean, there's all sorts <laughs> of like queen h8 funny business that's around the corner. But Shaba's now in time trouble. We haven't seen him get into time trouble yet so far today other than the one time he flagged in that, you know, what seemed to be a difficult Rook and Pawn in game. Yeah. I mean, as you can see, like, objectively, this is probably a draw, right? You see neither player making any progress for 10 moves or so. Objectively, no one should be able to win it. With nine seconds on the clock, anyone could lose it, especially by trying too hard to win, so. Right, although I like what Shabalov is trying to do here, bringing this rook around now to e5. f5 as a constant source of struggle, and now isn't there oh, a rook just, d6? He just, he just won something. I mean, I don't even know if this queen and pawn in game, like, how, how good are your queen and pawn in games? I don't even know if, like, white still has enough here to, uh, especially mine are, in the time, but Mine are pretty poor, but um, there's definitely some winning chances here, especially, you know, in a time scramble, there's a lot to work with. There's an isolated pawn, there's an open king. Ooh, that was risky to commit yeah, to F3. Yeah, F3, I wasn't so sure about now. I mean, now you just do don't you... have much time to... Because queen h1 is such a big threat, I think. Huge. And there's like no way to cover it. Maybe no at some way. point you have to play like h5, sacrifice the pawn, and then play queen h4. But even that's like still playing for perpetual. Okay, so queen g5. There's still no queen f5. Right. Now there's, there's nothing, I mean. Yeah, and this is what I was a little bit worried about. Now queen h1, queen g1, perhaps... Maybe king g4 to h5 here. Okay, but this is this is actually decent for white now because now at least it's established a pass pawn. I mean, I think black has excellent drawing chances, but this yeah. is probably better than it was 20 moves ago, right? Shaba's even offered a draw. I don't think I don't yeah. think he can win this because the black king's blocking that f pawn, um, and the white king is so open. So, Whew. all right, yeah. that was thrilling. That was thrilling. Let's check in on the match score because I've just been glued to this end game. 13 to 12 for bot and bot. And oh my goodness. Yeah. Uh, Alexander Shabalov might be regretting not seeing that rook a8 mode because that would have tied closer? up that score. Could it be any closer? 12 and a half to 13 would be an illegal score. So not really. Man, Shaba could have had that one. I mean, rook a8. You yeah. know, I mean, Grant Chu doesn't need an engine bar telling him that his player missed an opportunity there. Yeah, I'm sure. And I, I I have to wonder if maybe a little bit that's a psychological, like, oh, I, I was in a position similar to this before. Keep in mind, like, he ha had beaten uh, Kjartasen really early, 28 moves in the knockout battle. Yeah. He had all of that time to think. The duration of the Force and Esteban collar's draw, the duration of that bullet tiebreaker, the duration of the yeah. interview. And he's yeah. got, he's, he's thinking. It's like when you call a timeout right before a field goal yeah. kicker tries to attempt a field goal. You've got to think, like, oh, I had that. I, I was so close. This is going to put Pittsburgh back into the competition and now he's going to have to and, start it all over again and he used that time well i mean he picked a good approach to the game overall right i mean yeah. that opening position he got was great he had pressure on kolar's like from start to finish it always felt like a tough game for black so Absolutely. that was i mean that was well done but you know you got to be able to you got to be able to finish too and uh he had you know two minutes on the clock against 30 seconds when he was in that decisive phase and had a winning move and uh you know i think i think i think grant probably had an ouch moment somewhere there yeah i mean the good news for them is now the match is tied up at 13 all and i'm looking at the games that are left right that's what's yeah. going to matter it's not just the game between shabalov and you know, dimitri collars it's the game between artak manukian and blizzard right it's yeah. the game on the board I'm looking that manukian actually won that won that game so as you said i mean he's made up for for a bad showing for San Francisco. I think everyone always plays better when they're not on the San Francisco team. He lost that pawn on D5 and then goes on to win this end game down a pawn. I mean, so, this is classic Artak Manukian. This is how he plays every game. Wow. Oh. I mean... He wins this? Wow. He wins a rook end game down a pawn? Down a pass pawn. Crazy, right? <sighs> so, anyway. Back to this game here. And what do you think of um, what do you think of uh, oh I guess we'll get back to this in a second. 
<laughs> we're gonna when when we come back from our little break, we'll be on to this game here between Alexander Shabalov with black against uh, Dmitry Kolars with white in this sort of closed Sicilian, which uh, Kolars is now opening. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. I do not lie often, but when I do, it's always about something unimportant. Here we are, and we are not looking at Grandmaster Alexander Shabalov against Grandmaster Dmitry Kolars. Instead, we are seeing Kangaroo 55 versus Refan 2236, 1100 versus 1400. He has just shocked him with a tactic. Rook takes E2 check. Oh my goodness, Kangaroo. Kangaroo's on the ropes. Queen takes B1 as possible now. Yeah, I should have perhaps played rook h2 to def over defend the e2 square. Instead, he tries to stop the bishop on g4 from attacking e2 because of queen g7 mate. Now it redounds in his it. opponent's favor as his opponent picks up the rook on b1 with the rook e2 uh, deflection of the knight on c3. Queen comes back here, and next move there will be knight f5, knight f6, not not allowing mate on this file here. So, oh, I like this. Huge point for Pittsburgh, right? Their 1100 player picking up a win, depending on his endgame technique. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of chess game. left to be played here. It's 14 to 14. And one thing that's worth noting here, if you take a look at the scoreboard for all of the games remaining in the live club match, a lot yeah. of the games where bottom bottom was heavily favored early in the match, those games are over. They cannot add more points for bottom bottom. We've got an even match. And frankly, all the games that are left are fairly even games or games where Pittsburgh is favored. And that's a bad sign for Baden Baden if they were hoping to pick up six points today and ultimately make a jump to the top of Group B. Uh, group B. Yeah. I think this German player also has neither been to Australia nor really searched very hard on the internet because his picture of a kangaroo is more of a koala. Yeah. Um, that was one of the first things I noticed, actually. Yeah. So, I mean, you got to think. You got to think his, his knowledge of koalas and kangaroos is not up to par. Yeah, I think that the, the combination between koalas and kangaroo there might be quite the leap. So we've seen some end games go wrong. We were just talking about, about how Artak Manukian beat a 2100 player in a rook and pawn ending down a pawn that no one ever would have any business winning. Um, you want to you wanna make any predictions on the end game technique of our 1100 star refon? So I've coached enough 1100s to know that uh, end games are, are just random variables and stats, right? I mean, keep in mind that there is a difference of an exchange here, uh, and that's going to make things a little bit complicated, I think, um, you know, for black, but for white. I mean, there's a lot of ways that this can go wrong, right? Like you drop the C4 pawn, you drop the D5 pawn. <laughs> oh, Isaac, you're right. I had miscounted the pieces. Black was down a rook before all these combinations, so they're still losing. They're not winning. Yeah, I mean, but I mean, okay, like this is still under 1500 level chess, like anything. How I, I was trying to figure out, like, you know, once you said like queen f5, I'm like, wait, where's the follow up? It's complicated, but queen f4, I was like, I was like, this is a good move, right? Um, uh, <laughs> I didn't realize he was down a rook in the starting position, so I thought he'd just won a piece, which he did. I mean, rook takes e2, queen b1 was winning a piece. I just didn't know that 
I'm used to positions starting out with equal material, not someone just having a random extra rook. Sure, but okay, in this position still, there's definitely chess to be played here. He might black still as his G-pawn. I could very easily see a situation where white underestimates how strong this could be as a potential pass pawn later in the game. Plays right. G5, moves his king up the board, moves a bishop out of the way, moves his pawn down the board. The light squared bishop and the knight are going to work together nicely. That knight on E5 is a rock. How is white's rook getting through if there's no serious open files with this pawn going to G5 really quickly? I just don't see it. So this right. one I can still see going either way considering the rating level. Um, yeah. and having coached so then, a lot of people in this in this rating range but so then the discussion is can this you know kangaroo uh use a rook against bishop and pawn which is a very tough end game to win it's a very small margin to win and we've got another end game basically very very similar material balance i believe between louisen 17 and typewriter 44 um these are both 1500 players so very closely balanced in rating and uh white has a rook against a bishop um, yeah this one is where experience is going to pay off ultimately. I saw typewriter 44, you know, when I was analyzing all of the live club match results and everything, consistently yep. playing for the St. Louis Archbishop. So he knows what it's like to be on a team that wins. Mm. He knows what it's like to be in a close match. He knows what it's like to be in a game where your team ultimately gets blown out. He has that experience. He knows how to play these games. And he has a lot of, you know, games where he's been in situations like this. I wouldn't be surprised to see a comeback on this one either. Exchange at this level. You know, again, random variable, anything can happen. But if yeah. Black wants to make a comeback, that bishop on c7 has to be a better piece. Yeah, I mean, the close center is interesting, but here's checkmate, knight g5. And I was going to compliment Luisen on this h4 move because I think it's a very, very smart way of trying to move forward and uh, and take advantage of this because if Black had played h6 to stop knight g5, he had rook takes h6. That's a lot of progress. The h pawn's already starting to run. And if not, this knight g5 move is like a huge problem, right? It can start a mating attack. It could win the h7 pawn. Uh, Rook on g7, very unfortunate square to go to. And he just KOs himself there by and resigns before walking into this back rank mate. And that's a big point for Pittsburgh. We're now tied up at 16 again. Yeah. So again, this match Ties it up. can go either way. Remember, if this match ends in a tie, bottom, bottom gets the extra bonus point. Pittsburgh, we get one. Bottom, bottom, we'll get two. But considering where Pittsburgh's at now... A tie doesn't really help at this point. You have to win the match. So you have to win the match. If they tie, they only get one out of three points. Two goes to bottom, bottom because they had more growth this week by only eight fans, but still. I mean, that's such a um, huge margin to be down by three points to third place. You have like almost yeah. realistically no chance of making it in. Very tough. They would need like, you know, a five or six point. Uh, they would need Reykjavik to lose their live club match to get there. Yeah. Yeah. And they and play Barcelona. Have to like, you know, break Daniel Force and Esteban and Dimitri Kolars' like lock grip on the on the on the finals. So they might need the fan growth to get a Wonder White against one of those guys or to get Shaba White against one of those guys. They might not want to go back into the knockout phase, giving draw odds might be too much. Yeah, and that's actually one thing that you know I'm glad that we're discussing because for both of these teams, let's remind you of who they're playing next week. Pittsburgh's playing Barcelona. Barcelona is going to outnumber Pittsburgh in that fan club match unless they get their act together and bring more fans next week. Reykjavik yeah. is now 2-0 in the live club matches, so if that's three points going to Reykjavik, where is Baden-Baden getting their points? It's this match and then the knockout battles next week. Oh, Isaac, can we just talk the technique for a second here? Because yeah. our, our viewers want to learn something as well about the chess not just how to get people into our fan clubs. The correct technique here for white is to get the rook to h8, right? You want to get behind the pawns and start attacking the queen side pawns from behind. This mm -hmm. king and bishop, you cannot beat that unit frontally with your rook. Right. They will always defend the e and g pawns. All that's going to happen is slowly those pawns could get to like g4 and start to get stronger. Right. So the correct technique is you go to h8, you swing over to the queen side, you eat one or two pawns from behind, and then you get back to f8 or g8 in time to stop black from queening. Right. That's the only way to, to win this thing. Instead, a4, and now c2, bishop c2. I mean, it's just, you've just nailed all your pawns immovably onto light squares for this bishop. So as yeah. you move your rook to like h1, h8, like I'm saying, bishop c2 comes down and you can lose. I mean... And this is what I was saying, the random variable of the exchange at the under 1600 rating level. I mean, bishops can be just as valuable as rooks in the right circumstances. And ooh, nice tactic there. Rook takes that five. I say that? g5 d6 and he just runs the d pawn all the way he had, to, he had to play g6 there and then he would have been right. actually perfectly okay he would need to still have the g pawn on g7 that's why white didn't play d5 before as soon as the pawn goes to g5 he goes d6 there's no longer g6 d7 king e7 and now he's won it easily well that was some alertness yeah and that's going to be koala a huge blunder there for the Pittsburgh pawn grabbers with bottom bottom getting this point because all White has to do now is so pick up the pawns and walk the dog. He's going to take that one and we're going to turn to Fedya against Simon.
Fedya S, Rook Endgame. White has beautiful activity, beautiful, and won the previous game with black. So we have to put our money on white. Absolutely. And this would be a huge point with a score still at 16 16. And we know that that game that we just looked at is going to go bottom bottom's way. So he is playing for the pawn grabbers. A point just came in for bottom bottom. It was the point we were watching. There's only so many spots now, though, where points can be left. I mean, there's still I think the Shamala. just won another game in this Maturin versus Bayou thing. Oof. Still some games left. I noticed we that. We uh, checked out our GMs for a while, but look, they've got all their pieces on the board. So I mean, we knew that that game would take the longest. Fed, so yeah. one, one note to make, by the way, uh, Che XC is playing for Pittsburgh Pong Grabbers as Nathan Holzmuller, assistant general manager for the Pittsburgh Pong Grabbers. He's a really strong player here in Pittsburgh. He's playing against the 1700, and he's still okay. got one game left too. Still got one game left, and it's already 1-1. One, one. Um, okay, and... This end game here, White can win by bringing their king to g6 right now. Even though they're Absolutely. losing everything on the second rank, I think that would do it. Um, could you throw in rookie eight to e7 first? You can, because if the king comes to g6, you have rook g7 and g4 to yep. win the game. So now he can go king f5 to g6. He's got to be careful about that time, though. He's got 20 Not seconds left. king e6 to e6. That is completely wrong. Got to get that shelter. I mean, you have to put the king on g6. That pawn on g5 is now a bad omen for black. And the match is now 17 to 17. Pittsburgh. Which game do you think uh, Grant is more worried about at this not point? Not to choke here. Which game is Grant the most worried about right now? How many boards does he have up right now? Oh, the king found the correct direction. There's still time to make this work. I mean, rook takes a two, king g6, and we're back to square one. Black's in trouble. Yeah, I mean, they'll have to go to like f2 and sack for the f6 pawn. Um... And by the way, can I, I just say, like, that. how mature it was to just admit the mistake and play King to F5? Because in a lot of these situations, it's so hard to say, oh, I messed it up. All right, I'm going to go back and I'm going to make the correct move now. Especially at the higher levels, you see where players are, like, trying to, you know, prove that they're making the best move every move. Um, King F5, just a really mature, you know, move here for White. Artak has finished his job, won a second game with endgame technique. So if he had White in this game here for Fedya and Pittsburgh, we could be certain that White would convert this Rook endgame. Having seen Artak convert that rook endgame down a pawn, um, this would be child's play. I think I think Fedya's got it too now. I mean, once you get your king to g6, it's hard to go wrong here. Right. The only way that I think white can mess this up, for example, rook e2, rook a8, king, uh, rook e8, uh, rook, e rook takes e8, king takes. He's got to remember he's got to play king g7 because if he lets black play king f8, he loses the pawn endgame. Yeah, that's also on rook e2, rook h7 is a direct knockout. A game just ended in a draw, which did not break the tie. 17 and a half, 17 and a half. My goodness. And we still got that game going on between Shabala. Still There's got still two early top board games going on. Oh, the king's running out of there. Should you grab the A pawn before you play F7? You've got six seconds. I think you got to just queen at this point. Okay, you got to just, just move Queen something. and trust that the rook is good. Although, I mean, if... if no, you no, you should just take the pawns because they can't stop you from queening. Yeah, that's true too. But, if okay, it's... Approaches to E7, you can always play rook A7 check. So just grab a pawn. Black right, should and pawn... Like C6 here. That's the wrong direction. Yeah, and now king e7, but now rook e8, right? Oh, rook, yeah. oh, rook a7, rook a7. Of that course. was smart. But rook f6 check first, right? Rook f6. Oh, rook f6 would ruin him, yeah. That's uh, really that's bad a missed news. opportunity for bottom bottom, and that's important because Pittsburgh just took the lead. It's Every move here is a missed opportunity. Okay, so we Man, finally have the check on the back. Uh, on the back. King has to make a decision somewhere. Yeah. Actually, this is... You know, this is slowly simplifying into finally a win for white. Yeah, I think and if Rook takes B2 winning just now. Wait, isn't Rook takes a seven check good here for black? Yeah. Yeah. Very good for black. Very <laughs> good. Oh, and that's unfortunate because Pittsburgh had the lead and this is going to blow it unless he's able <laughs> oh, to my goodness. somehow win all these pawns and start pushing. Oh, they did need Artak here. They needed him so badly in this Rook endgame. And he's calling poor technique just like we are. Yeah. Oh my goodness. So what how much room is left in the match? I don't know. It looks like we've got our top two boards, and then I know Ferd the Absurd, who's 18 and the Absurd. Should we see he's, what his game looks like? I believe he's streaming right now, so let's take a look. Ferd the Absurd has got white here, four of the pawn grabbers, and three connected pass pawns. You would think that would be enough. Again, it would we've, be enough for our it, right? <laughs> Will it be we've, enough for Ferd? Oh my goodness. Fedya can still fight for a draw. I mean. I mean, Queen versus Rook is still a tough game. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's, let's see Fern's technique. I mean, 
I'm interested in every game, but in a sense, Fedya has already spoiled us with uh, with with that technique. So let's give Ferd a chance to show us the good and, stuff. And keep in mind, there's only four games remaining in this live club match. If Ferd is able to win and give the Pong Grabbers what we assume will become a one point lead after Fedya loses, if he were to lose, yeah, that is. I mean, now Kalars has to beat Shabalov. Yeah, and that first and that game, game is played, pretty intense. Maybe we should have a look. Let's take a quick look at that. Knight, like, Bishop, Knight, Rook. I know they're going to finish last, but they are the GMs. And their game is insane. I mean, Kolars is up in exchange with his queen trapped. Rook to A8 is on the table, right? Has Shabanov yeah. won the game here? He's just, doing the, he's just doing the math here. Rook A8. Well, he missed Rook A8 in the first game, so he's actually got to find it in this one too, right? But yeah. I think this one's a lot easier to find. Rook A8. What? That queen money's What's wrong with Rook A8? my friend what what's wrong with rook a8 my friend knight takes d5 oh my god it was knight takes d5 oh if rook a8 knight takes d5 let's go back and take a look at that because i don't think you know I, I don't know if our audience can fully see that boom <sighs> if knight takes he's got queen takes if queen takes he's got queen takes and if rook a6 he's got knight e7 to c6 Oh, incredibly strong Kolars with the like the the last breath sort of defensive options right and he's been so good at this today like okay so you have to give up the exchange notice that if rookie won the queen actually doesn't have any escape squares there so that move was required he's going to pick up this pawn on b5 there was also the winning move knight g5 if the rook moved i noticed um, yes that too so okay so he picks up b5 though but this is like the Kolars thing right just barely survived then like he's like got this a pawn for later Oh my goodness. And this game is incredibly important now because it's 19 and a half, 18 and a half. And there's only three games. Uh, there's only two games left. Can Shaba point. take C2? He must want C2, right? Don't you want C2? Now Queen D3 seems to cover everything. Could, oh man. I mean, they're, they're, they're at a good level. Anything can happen. And he did see that they both saw that Knight takes D5 stuff. So we got to trust them a little bit. I wonder if Shaba had thought maybe he was going to play f5, and that's why he allowed queen d3. So then that way, if queen takes, he has f takes e4. Mm -hmm. um, but now white is getting really active. And if Shabalov can draw, he's in good shape here. It's enough for his team, you think? I mean, they're up one point with two games left. I mean, that puts a lot of trust in your one teammate. They're up but... two points. They're, they're up, up two, two points. points with two games. So a draw does it. A draw in either of the two games. Simon beat Fedya, but despite that, Fur the Absurd converted and... Uh... That leaves that two, must be almost over. They're up two points with what? Two games. two games still going? They're up one point with two games still going. Okay, Bottom happy. Bond just got a point. So Optimus and Crumb Cr Cr Master, could we have another draw? Uh, so this is a draw. So a draw in the Pittsburgh game will be Not enough. Possible. I mean, Black could also win somehow. But I mean, okay, can't you just play Bishop A7, Bishop B6 for eternity? Maybe. I okay, might Bishop get made it by like a knight on D5 or something. I don't know. I think I think white has enough to draw here, and I don't think black has okay enough. So, uh, and this is looking good for Shabalov if he can manage a d3 followed by c3, finally getting that win. So c3 here, force rook f1. Wait, how's he winning though? This is complicated. I don't know if I would have played c2 there. I thought maybe king f6 first would have been sufficient. Now he's I'm down, actually not down two pawns sure. right now. I would have I would have waited on c2. I don't think that was necessary. He's down two pawns right now. I think he's losing. Honestly, it looks just like the result of the last. Rook endgame they had, right? Where somehow all the smoke cleared and Kolars had two extra pawns somehow. Yeah. Which could give them a tied match, right? That's what bot and bot needs. That tied match would get them two points. That's that's enough for them with how Kolars has been doing in the knockouts. Yeah. They're the team that just needs anything from the from the team matches because they've got Kolars in the knockouts. And now, I mean, you have to imagine Shabalov is really regretting that Rook A moment in that first live club match game. Oh, king to d4? It's not over yet. All Shabalov has to do is draw, based on what we understand on the other game. All right, so he starts pushing. It's time to push. Maybe he should have pushed last move. I think king d2, he didn't really yeah. see that this king d4 was going to be such a problem. Yeah, and this is actually a big issue. Although, black is kind of stuck, right? If you play rook d3, you have to be ready to allow king takes c2. And if you play rook a3 at that point, I mean, you got to be precise because your king's out in the wide open. But he wants to play rook takes g3, right? So that's why yeah. the pawns needs to start running. And actually, king d2 is a mistake, and maybe it should even go back to e2. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so that rook d3 won't come with check. 
then anytime rook takes d3 is played, you've got rook takes c2, right? And and then win that. All right. So the b pawn's got to be the one to run first because the king's covering b3. Wow. So, yeah. So if Baden Baden can win this game, it'd be 19.5 to 19 point. It would be 20 to 20. The other game just ended in a draw, as you predicted correctly. And then because Baden Baden had more fan growth this week, does A5, A6 do it? King B3, Rook B8, Rook C7. Oh my goodness. But if they get to 2020, they get two out of three points for the draw because of the fan growth as the tiebreaker in that match. That's yeah. just how all the matches work. There's always a team that got more fans that week. They get the two to one. All right. So he wants to play A5, A6, A7. Um, and what can... Well, he's got seven a lot seconds of time to here. do it, but what time? What can he do with this time, Shaba? Can he run the f pawn? The can problem with e six. Yeah, the a problem five, with f four is king it's six, seven. on the seventh. King c six, a six, king b six. Check. King a seven. Oh, is this going to be enough? Oh, but rook c eight. F pawn with his king, I guess. But isn't rook c eight just going to be? You just make sure the king, oh you have to make sure the king's on the square though. Rook C would have would have not been enough. Ooh, but now you can can't you just play F three there and just sacrifice and go for the draw? Oh, he could have played Rook takes F four there. Oh no, because King A six the pawn is still covered. Yeah. Okay, so you got to come here. I mean, you would oh, think yeah, that White could still win this somehow. Yeah, I'm not sure if Black is doing is is handling this correctly and letting the White King get so far off the board. Maybe he's trying to play for stalemate tricks. That could be a thought here. But the problem Ooh, is... The, rook F8, that was smart. I think White has it now. Yeah, I mean, this is looking really bad now for Shabal. Rook takes F3 would have been a state because Black could have sort of checked him forever, put his Rook on B1, and then it's a draw, I think. And maybe maybe Shabal up here, and as he loses on time, thought Rook B, B1 was going to be enough, but forgot that Rook A1 was going to get the job done. So Kalar's best Whoa. Shabal up today after wow. three games where Shabal was just completely outplaying that's Kalar's some, at some point. That's some bullet stuff, right? That's like finding those little... This last little Rook tactics there's tons of tactics in those end games um little details um so as you guys can see the match is complete draw 20 to 20 pittsburgh against bottom and bottom much better showing for the pittsburgh fans than last Just week i mean not enough where it counted better but isaac is it going to be enough to keep them in the playoff hunt it's not looking good i mean with that with that two points going to bottom bottom's way they now have eight points they take the group lead barcelona now will have seven and reykjavik yeah. has six so here's so what much for happen. barcelona running away with it they're not even first place much less by a lot but here here's what here's what pittsburgh is going to have to do next week they play barcelona they must win that match and they must hope that bottom bottom beats reykjavik that morning so bottom bottom beats reykjavik if Barcelona loses to Pittsburgh, then Pittsburgh has a chance to get a six-point week. At that point, they'll be level with Reykjavik, and Reykjavik has not done well in the knockout battles. I think Pittsburgh needs to look at trying to finish uh, third place unless they can have a perfect week. But even a perfect week at this point, that's only, that's only eight points in the standings. And Barcelona is going to get more than one point. Bottom, well, they're bottom. up to three points. They're up to three points right now, Isaac, right? Uh, they're up to three points. But okay, right. so six-point week gets one, you to two, nine. Three. So they could get to nine. But if Reykjavik... Nine is basically the average number of points, right? Yeah. So, so for them to not be basic, for them to be in the top two with nine points, they would need a four-way tie at nine, which may be mathematically possible, but it's unlikely. It's unlikely that that's how everything's going to shake out, right? So, I think it's all up to how Reykjavik does next week. Reykjavik can either make the playoffs or finish in fourth next week. If if they have another bad knockout battle showing and bottom bottom brings the energy that they brought today but converts in critical positions, yeah. and Reykjavik has a zero-point week, then third place is very possible for Pittsburgh. Second place yeah. is they're going to need Barcelona. They're going to have to – well, they play Barcelona, so that's good. So that, that's in their control. If they can beat Barcelona, Barcelona only gets one point in the knockout battles, then they've got a shot. But they need some things to go their way, but some things are in their control too. So it's not completely out of it for Pittsburgh. Yeah, but uh, Pittsburgh's, uh, yeah, I mean, they're basically fighting for, I would say, for third place if Reykjavik finally loses a club match. Yeah, but I mean, would you have to say, though, that Pittsburgh would probably be one of the favorites in the Twitter vote if they can make it a third? I mean, that would be a big jump for them considering where they've been these past yeah. couple of weeks. I think they have to be a favorite in that Twitter vote. Yeah, I agree. And I think that's what that's what they want to go for now is is third place. I think I think the the dominance of Force and Esteban and Dimitri Kolars to finish first and second in the knockouts for two weeks in a row is really like 
having a huge impact on the standings here. And I mean, does Pittsburgh have somebody who can tell Grant Shu, I'm ready to beat Kolars and then force an Esteban in succession, right? Because that's what it's going to take to win that knockout. I think, you know, Barcelona I, and Bon and Bon are happy to keep sending those guys. I think based on the uh, based on the lineup that Pittsburgh has, their best shot might be to play Tuan Min Lee, who's a you know wonderful time on chess.com, one of the best bullet players on yeah. chess.com, top five, or bring Evgeny Postny and try to outplay Dimitri Kolaris. But that doesn't, you know, that doesn't rule out maybe uh, bottom bottom bring Georg Meyer next week because they can potentially clinch, you know, the group victory there by, you know, basically winning their live club match and Barcelona is going to just be too far out. So right. you know, a lot at stake, a lot of different variables. Um, but I, I think it's ultimately going to come down to how does Reykjavik do? If Reykjavik has a zero point week next week, which is very possible given how they've done in the knockout battles, then this thing blows wide open. If Reykjavik wins their knockout battle, Barcelona should be a little bit scared. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can see, I can see Re- Reykjavik winning their, their live club match. <laughs> They've very done so well, though, so far. And, um, and then I guess the question for them, if they really want to bring it, is like, do they have somebody who can beat Kolars and then force an Esteban? I mean, know, or Meyer, if he, if he takes himself off, if he takes himself off the bench. I mean, that'd be like, we said Kolars is the new Akobian. If he gets benched after winning two knockouts, it's like, what am I supposed to do, man? <laughs> I mean, that, that that would be that would be Seattle trying to uh, not run the run the football in the Super Bowl and throwing an interception instead. I mean, that would be the equivalent of that moment. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I think you know Baden Baden is going to be pretty happy with today. I mean, today went basically the best. You know, it went as good as well as it could have. I mean. A two-point draw against Pittsburgh was a great result, I think, for Baden Baden. And that final win for Dimitri Kolars felt like a match win for Baden Baden. And I think that that's yeah. an important point. It um, did, because that was from zero points to two, right? That that was the difference. If he'd drawn that rook end game, they get zero points for the club match. He he wins it, they get two points. Right. Um that I mean, it's just it's just huge. The the standings would just be a clump if they hadn't had that, right? Yeah, if Pittsburgh would be at five six, points, and Baden Baden would be at eight. six. And Pittsburgh would be at five, so it would be like seven, six, six, seven, five. six, six, five. Right? That's as clumped as you can possibly be. And that would so, have been a dream scenario for Pittsburgh, by the way. Just one game difference. Yeah, yeah. Um, that really would have been the group of life. We did not see anybody run away with things this week, but Pittsburgh put themselves in a tough position. Um, or really, we could say Dmitry Kolar's put Pittsburgh in a tough position, right? I mean. I mean, I would argue that Shabalov put uh, put uh, Pittsburgh in a tough position, right? I mean, he okay. had these opportunities, right? And that's the key thing with both Kolaris and Force and Esteban. They've both yeah. been dominant, but they've both had these moments where they've slipped up and their opponents just haven't been able to convert, where they've gotten those opportunities and just given them the time trouble, they just haven't been able to push it. We saw it with a Wander yeah. last week as well against Force and Esteban. So, you it's know, true. It's, it, it, three, it goes both ways. There were three games today between Shabalov and Kolaris. If Shaba scored half a point more in any of those three games, any half point was worth two points Yes, for Pittsburgh in the standings. And Barcelona uh, would be a lot happier for it going into the next week. So yes, he lost this tough game here to, to Kolars, but the first game, which he drew against him, he had that rook a eight move, just ending things. Um, unless we find out afterwards that somehow we're both blind and there was a piece that could stop him from losing his queen <laughs> yeah i mean that that game was absolutely insane but go back to that first game during the live club match and I mean, the, the knockout yeah. battle rather i mean that was the one that i felt like really got away and we heard grant say it in the interview like you can't play in shabala because like this is the way that he plays and these things happen but it's all about making your mark and converting and it was just not his day-to-day which is unfortunate but you know regardless of who pittsburgh brings next week i think we can we can foresee very enterprising play coming from their designated player Absolutely. So as we prepare to sign off, everybody, we're going to remind you of like the schedule, upcoming matches so that you can get in on things. Uh, The last match that we've just been talking about for Division B will be next week, Saturday at the same time. And uh, that's uh, June 3rd, uh, 6th. Why am I misspeaking? I was thinking 13th already for the (laughs) match. July 6th, actually. July July 6th. Yeah. July 6th, next week, same time, 8 a.m. Pacific uh, time. And uh, there will be two club matches that you can join as well. And uh, then after that, we'll have a slight time change as we get into Division C on July 13th. Okay, the time will be moving one hour. In which direction, Isaac? Up, down? So it's 7 a.m. Pacific starting for Group C. And then it's uh, 9 a.m. 9 a.m. Pacific starting for Group D. So from July 13th through 27th, there will be three Saturdays where it will be one hour sooner than this. And uh, 
you know, uh, Artak Manukian here in chat. Thank you for playing and supporting other teams. He asks you guys to be ready to join the Eagles on July 13th when Division C kicks off. And uh, with that, remember to join your favorite fan clubs if you want to play. And we hope to uh, see you all competing for the best fan prize next week and helping your teams to score the points to get into the Summer Series Championships. So, David, you know what time it is? It's time for the post-match show. It's time for the post-match show with uh, GM Canty, James Canty, the third national master out of Michigan. And we're going to be rating him where you will be able to watch his uh, you know, analysis and make sure to bring your games. We know that that's a very valuable learning experience. I've watched him do some of this analysis post-show uh, following the commentary, and he does a really good job with these players who are trying to learn from these live club matches and be a better player for their team in the following week. So if you're a player for Barcelona, Reykjavik, Baden-Baden, or Pittsburgh, this is your opportunity to get that extra morsel of knowledge that might make the difference next week. That might make that half point difference in a live club match and get your team two or three extra points. Yeah, so that, that could be a fairly instructive moment. And I encourage all of you guys for the next two hours to go tune into his channel. Uh, a lot of really instructive stuff there. So definitely make sure to join that raid uh, for all of you. And for those of you guys watching on chess.com, make sure to click through on Twitch. Join our official you know, channel here. Hit the follow button so you get notified every time we go live for the Pro Trust League Summer Series. So you'll never miss a match um, just by watching us here on twitch.tv slash chess. So thank you I'm so much. I'm not going to miss any matches. So you better not. <laughs> All right, everybody. We'll see you next week. Enjoy the post-game show. See you guys.